Hi, welcome back guys. This is your friend, the DN What If, with another fanfiction. This is the first part of What If Deku Was Godzilla. Please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. Now let's get into the fanfic. Cold. That's all he felt. Darkness was all he saw. But in that darkness, something stirred, and a voice cried out to him. Wake up. A pair of blood-red eyes snapped open, quickly darting around and observing the surroundings. He was in some kind of yellow liquid, with strange metal objects connecting to him, somehow piercing his skin. Wait. His blood-red eyes widened in shock, as he held up his hands in front of him, looking over them with wide eyes. Why do I have hands? No, wait, how do I have hands? Where am I? He looked around in panic and anger, searching for signs of who was responsible. The last thing he remembered was entering a short hibernation, only a couple hundred years at best. Yet now here he was, wherever here is, taking deep breaths. He calmed himself, something his queen had taught him to do whenever he was caught off guard or found himself in a bizarre situation that he couldn't explain. While it only really helped protect whoever was responsible for his distress, it certainly helped keep the queen off his tail, turning his red eyes to his body. He looked over himself, and with a scowl, he confirmed his worst suspicions. He was indeed a small, bald ape. However, even as he looked at himself, he felt a sense of relief as he saw that his body still retained traces of his kaiju form. His tail remained black scales and all. His forearms, despite his earlier panic, while more human in appearance and structure, were still covered in his black scales, and his neck shared the same, he also kept his gills. However, his dorsal plates, save for those on his tail, were completely gone, and so were the rest of his scales. In keeping in the human tradition, his waist and legs were covered in thin black material, not unlike his queen's silk. With his new condition confirmed, he felt his confusion, quickly turning into burning rage. How dare those insignificant pests? I will see them all burn reaching up to the metal contraption covering his snout. And mouth, he remembered the humans called it, he tore it off in a single movement. Almost immediately, alarms blared in his ears, and red lights spun and shine outside his cage. But he didn't care. Using his arms he tore through the metal contraptions that were connected to him, before with one hand, smashing through the clear material, glass, in front of him. As the yellow liquid drained from the glass cage, he growled and left the cage. The first thing he realized, was that the ground was cold and smooth. Far too much for his liking. The next thing he realized was that the world felt different, alien in a way, but familiar just the same. I need to return to my territory. There I can make sense of this place. Looking around, he seemed to be in some kind of metal box, similar to what the humans stored their resources and food within, which meant the walls were made of thin metal, easily breakable. Without a second's hesitation, he charged through the walls, the metal easily breaking as he barreled through them. Later, as he trekked through the forest, a low growl escaped through his lips. While I seem to be in Japan, the entire world seems to be different. Older, alien almost, there's no trace of other titans. The ape's former home is gone, and the world below the world is gone, replaced by a solid core of fire and iron. At least the veins below the world still remain. There is no way around it. I am no longer home. As the words flickered through his mind, he released a louder growl and broke a nearby tree in half with his tail. He was stranded in another world, trapped inside a bald monkey, with no idea how he got here or how to get home. While he could always seek out the local alpha, it seemed that several of the locals were quickly approaching him. You, halt. He looked up with a blank face to the source of the voice. It was definitely human and from the sounds of it a human female. Probably, he had been tricked too many times by what JR had called traps on anime, and had thus lost nearly all certainty when gender was concerned with the humans. However, it would seem that the voice was definitely female in origin, as a dark-skinned, long-haired female jumped down in front of him. She was short, around half his height. Her body was well-built, strong, and defined unlike what most other human females had. Her eyes, like his, were completely red, a rarity in the human species. She seemed to have a white and brown tone, as while her skin was dark, her clothes, hair, and ears were white. Wait, are those rabbit ears? He thought in surprise, his mind doing a double-take as he inspected the female's body. Yep, she was definitely half rabbit. She had the ears and small fluffy tail to match, although she was wearing fake rabbit feet. Also, her clothing was rather revealing, but he wasn't one to judge. He walked around buck nude most of the time and had the displeasure of seeing the humans wear far less. Who are you? And why are you here? The female asked, and he merely growled in response. A human had no place demanding to know who he was or why he was here. But much to his disdain, he would need to cooperate to find his way home. Even though this planet seemed to be just as polluted as his own. Who are you? He asked, his voice gravelly and roughly 50x deeper than the females in front of him. This caught the female off guard. Who am I? I'm Mirko. She said sounding offended. 
And apparently, she was much more famous than he thought since when he didn't react she continued to speak. The bunny hero. I'm in the top 7 of Japan. She continued. But all she got was a raised brow? Sure. Whatever. He muttered and deciding he didn't want to deal with the midget, attempted to walk past her. Only for her to stomp on his tail, making him pause as he looked back at her. Get off he growled, sending the human a death glare. When she didn't move, he bared his teeth. Unless you want me to break your pathetic spine, get off. He yelled, throwing her off his tail and into the nearby trees in a swift movement. Snorting, he turned around to leave, when he felt something kick him in the back, and he stumbled, falling to a knee in surprise as he looked back to see the woman completely unharmed. An excited grin on her face as she bounced from one leg to the other. Surprised you didn't go flying from that love tap. Maybe you'll be a decent warm-up, lizard guy. How the hell did she move me? No human, hybrid or otherwise, should be capable of moving me. Much less with a single blow. He growled in response, a warm-up. It seems the bug doesn't know her place. The human chuckled, as she raised her hands, we'll see, and charged at him with surprising speed. Jumping above him, the woman raised her right leg before shouting, Luna fall, and bringing the limb down at him. However, raising his tail, he easily blocked the strike and looked at the woman with a bored expression as her eyes widened. See what? He taunted, before flicking his tail and sending the woman flying over the tree's canopy. With a scoff, he turned around and went to leave. Don't ignore me, bastard. This time the kick was much more powerful, but unlike before, he didn't stumble and merely turned around to face the white-haired woman, who was seething with rage. You want to tussle? Let's tussle, she yelled, rushing at him, becoming a blur of white and brown as she did. Hum, interesting. Not only does she possess superior strength and speed to normal humans, but far greater durability. He observed, as she again yelled, Luna Ark, and launched a kick at him. Stumbling back and grunting at the impact, he grabbed the woman's leg with his tail, lifted her up, and spun her around above his head, before once again throwing her away. You cannot match me bug. Accept your defeat, he said. But much to his surprise the woman got up again, a grin still clear on her face. You say that, but you haven't even managed to hurt me, and I've managed to land two hits on you. His right eye twitched as he realized that, she was indeed right. He hadn't harmed the human, while she had managed to strike him twice. That was going to change. Growling, he said, come at me again, and I will show you the might of a kaiju. The woman scoffed, yeah we'll see, and charged at him once again. This time, she didn't yell out any words, and instead opted for punches and kicks. Grunting at the blows, he snarled as he swiped at the woman, who easily dodged and punched him again below the arm. Who taught you how to fight? A baby. The woman taunted. Angrily he swiped at the woman again, but she evaded his attack easily and kicked him in the stomach. You're all brawn no brains. This is almost too easy, the woman said. You want easy. I'll give you fucking easy. Acting quickly. He grabbed the woman's leg with his claws, before lifting her up and smashing her into the ground. Once, twice, three times. Then with a yell he threw her into the nearest tree with enough force that the tree broke in half, and she fell to the ground. Walking over to the fallen tree, as the woman struggled to lift it off her with her injuries, he slammed his foot onto the tree, pushing it down and earning a gasp of pain from the woman. Submit or die, he said, but the woman glared at him with venom. Never, he scoffed, your choice in taking a deep breath, he readied to call upon his atomic power. Texas smash. In an instant, a massive force of strength slammed into him, sending him flying and rolling through the forest, finally coming to a stop. He winced as he felt the bruising of his ribs and back from the attack and stood up. What the fuck was that? Glaring at the direction of the woman, he growled as a second figure appeared. He was tall, maybe even taller than him, and he was definitely muscular, far more muscular than him. Unlike the woman, he wore a complete and somewhat dignified outfit, albeit far too colorful for his liking. His hair was golden and had two strands sticking up above his head. Despite his muscular frame, however, his eyes were sunken, confusing him. Perhaps this man had some kind of medical condition? But most infuriatingly of all, a large smile bore on the stranger's face, like he was happy that he had just struck him. Thanks, all might, the woman said reluctantly to the new figure, who just laughed in response. You can thank me later Mirko. First, let's capture this villain. The blonde then turned to face him, and pointed a finger at him. Hear that. Your days of tyranny and prejudice are over villain. This man seemed to only have one volume. Loud. And you are. He called out to the newcomer, making both him and the woman freeze. Who am I? Why I am the symbol of peace. Japan's number one hero. All Might. Great. More obnoxious heroes with stupidly obnoxious names. What the hell were the mothers of this world thinking? Naming their kids things like Mirko and All Might. Next thing you knew there'd be some kid calling themselves King Explosion Murder or some crap. Yet as he readied to fight the duo, a small flare of pain in his side caught his attention. This, All Might, had managed to harm him, with his bare hands it seemed. That made him dangerous, and that made him a challenge. And who are you, villain? What is your name? All Might asked, causing him to stop. 
Humans gave each other names to distinguish them. He had never needed a name. He was the last of his kind after all. And the king of all kaiju, it was pretty obvious when someone talked about him, yet, he was in a different place, in human flesh. No, he would have to name himself. I am, Kajira. He answered, and All Might laughed, very well, Kajira. You are under arrest for the assault of a hero, and threat. I advise you come quietly. As All Might shouted the last words, he shot towards him even faster than the rabbit woman had, releasing a small shockwave as he did. Mirko, try as she might. Mirko couldn't help the frown that grew across her face as All Might charged at Kajira. Great, saved by the number one from a villain that no one's heard of. I don't even get to beat the bastard up myself. Eh, at least he'll get his ass handed to him by All Might. But when All Might threw his first punch towards the villain, Mirko's beliefs were thrown out the window. Because Kajira grabbed All Might's fist with one hand and a grunt. You are strong, All Might but as Kajira spoke. All Might brought back his left fist and yelled, Detroit Smash. As he punched Kajira point blank in the face, sending the villain flying back. Tumbling and crashing through the forest, earth, and stone leaving a massive trail. A tad overkill, but who am I to talk? All Might's fucking tough. Wincing from her wounds, broken ribs, and sprained legs she limped over to All Might's side. That was meant to be me. She grumbled and All Might laughed. Very well Mirko. Next time I'll let you defeat the villain. But as she rolled her eyes, she saw something at the end of the trail caused by All Might. Something moving in the dust. <sighs> no fucking way. She muttered her eyes widening. All Might frowned but turned his attention to where she was looking, and she heard a sharp intake of breath come from the hero. A faint blue light could be seen pulsing from within the dust. And with each blue pulse, with each soft hum, a figure was illuminated, standing, his tail producing the light as it slowly waved behind him, the hum slowly growing louder as the light became brighter. Using his tail Gajira swept away the dust, several bruises covering his body, and a furious glow in his red eyes. A single blue light began to flicker on Gajira's back. And as his eyes began to glow blue, he opened his mouth in a snarl, revealing that the inside of his throat glowed the same blue as his tail, back, and eyes. A feeling of dread filled Mirko. Her animal instincts screamed at her to run, and they screamed at her three words. Danger. Run. Survive. Then all hell broke loose as a blue beam of fiery energy erupted from Gajira's jaw and quickly shot towards them. Her eyes widened with fear as she tried to move, but she couldn't and only stood paralyzed as the beam shot towards her and all might. Kajira. A sharp pain shot through his throat, falling to his knees. Kajira coughed violently, his atomic breath vanishing as he did. His throat felt like it was burning. What the hell? Why does my throat hurt? It only took a moment for Kajira to realize why. He was no fool. Atomic energy was one of the most dangerous energies in existence, and few wielded its power as he could. His kaiju form was designed to wield atomic energy. But this, kaijin form was not. Damn, I can't use my atomic breath in this form. What the fuck am I meant to do? Looking up, Kajira remembered why he used his atomic breath in the first place. Are the bald apes dead yet? Walking over to where the duo were, he growled as he saw an absence of any shadow. So they escaped, likely all might. The other was far too wounded to escape from my atomic breath. He shook his head, it didn't matter anyway. If All Might was the number one hero, then he had nothing to worry about. All he had to do was find a way home. In a room filled with computers, a figure sat, watching and learning. He was short, bald, and wore a pair of glasses on his face, the only other recognizable trait being a mustache. Pewdie, status on the subject. A computer flickered on, a silhouette appearing on the screen. Pewdie nodded, yes, it is performing wonderfully. One of the computers in front of Kudai flickered to life, showing images captured by news reporters of the site of the confrontation. There are still signs of the brief conflict between the subject and the heroes Miraku and All Might, but the most eye-catching detail was the 10-kilometer-long trail of devastation and ash caused by the subject's power. And how is the constructed body holding up against its power? Kudai sighed, as the image in front of him flickered to the blueprints of his greatest creation. Namuji, a collection of the strongest corpses, from heroes and legends both modern and long past, Namuji had the greatest potential of any of his Nama. He even held a generous helping of Godzilla's DNA, which he suspected was the main reason Namuji hadn't fallen apart yet. Namuji was unlike any other Namu. Not only was he made from the corpses of many, but his conscience was never from their world. Namuji was made with one purpose in mind, to host and contain the apocalyptic might of a kaiju, so that the chaos, discord, and anarchy that they craved could come to pass. Namuji is doing well, however, there seems to be an unanticipated factor of the kaiju's power, which is, Hudai looked at the recorded feet of Namuji's awakening and paused it to inspect the flesh of the Namu. His flesh has been completely restored. There are no signs of stitching or deceased parts. He is by all accounts, completely alive. In fact, he has even evolved slightly. The kaijin traits were grown completely independently. When Namuji had first been finished, 
He appeared more monstrous than any of his other Namu, a terror made flesh, a demon some would have called him. This was purposeful, as a horrendous appearance would cause more hostility towards the Namu, and have a greater impact. But now, Namuji had no traces of his Namu origins, as stated before, looked completely human. As human as a kaijin could look at least. Hum, this is interesting. I had heard that the kaiju had powerful healing abilities, perhaps that is the cause. Namuji will operate alone. We need not manipulate him directly, lest he turns his fury upon us. We will focus on our other plans for now. But keep in mind, should Namuji prove to be defective, you will need more Namu to deal with him. Hyudai nodded as the silhouette vanished. And the communicator died. I will, oh I will. Aizawa, I am here. Entering the room like a hero. Aizawa sighed in annoyance as All Might ran into the room like a buffin. It was bad enough that Nezu had called a staff meeting. But it was much worse with the symbol of peace's unnecessary enthusiasm. Why are we here Nezu? I have classes to teach. Aizawa groaned, making the little rodent clap his paws in excitement. Certainly Aizawa. But first, All Might could you take a seat? Aizawa scoffed as he heard a yelp of surprise from the number one shortly followed by a scraping of chairs as he sat down. After a moment, Nezu brought out a remote. And with a press of a button, a live news feed of a nearby forest flickered to life. Aizawa recognized the scene. Earlier today All Might had confronted a villain with a destructive quirk that allowed him to shoot lasers from his mouth. But he hadn't needed to hear much more than that. It was clear with All Might standing next to him who had won. And who had ended up in the slammer, even if the news had stated the villain had been captured. I take it are all familiar with this scene. Nezu asked, and almost in unison all the staff nodded, with his Ashi, otherwise known as Present Mike, being the only to voice their thoughts, yeah, All Might had a brawl with some low-time villain and get thrown in the slammer as a result. Aizawa rolled his eyes, but loath as he was to admit, he doubted there was anything else. But much to his surprise, Nezu shook his head. Actually, no, he didn't. Silence fell through the room, as all the heroes stared at Nezu, then at All Might. What are you saying? The villain got away. Why's that gotta be hidden from the people? Not the first time. Nimuri, Aka Midnight, asked. Nezu sighed shaking his head, before clicking a button, and the news feed changed to two images of a hospitalized Mirko, with the words before and after labeled on them. This is why. Aizawa's eyes widened in shock as he saw the bunny heroine's previous condition. She was covered in bruises and injuries. Her skin was burned in several places, and her right arm was in a sling. And her current, the same, but lacking the burns, wounds, and sling of the previous photo. What happened to her? Aizawa asked, and seeing Nezu glance at All Might turned his gaze to the number one, show them my photo as well Nezu. All Might said, a hint of reluctance in his voice. Returning his gaze to the screen, his eyes widened even further as he saw a photo of All Might covered in burns, his arm hanging at an unnatural angle, his costume in tatters, and if anything in an even worse state than Mirko had been. What the fuck could do this? Nimiri asked, but Aizawa already suspected what? The villain, that All Might fought, he said, and Nezu nodded. The story being told to the reporters, news, and the public is a lie. This is the truth. Seven hours ago, an alarm was sounded inside the Solitude Forest. Mirko went to investigate, and was met by a man, who bears resemblance to a kaijin. Aizawa frowned. A kaijin? Nezu nodded. Indeed, a kaijin. As a kaiju is a mysterious monster. A kaijin is a mysterious human, which is to say, a human kaiju. But that was beside the point. Mirko questioned the kaijin and attempted to arrest him. In response, the kaijin became violent and assaulted her. This eventually led to Mirko's defeat, with the kaijin telling her to submit or die. And I'm guessing she chose death. Nimiri said Mirko's personality was rather well known after all, so it wasn't a surprise. Nezu nodded sadly. Indeed she did. And the kaijin prepared to end her. Thankfully All Might was able to arrive in time to save her and had a brief encounter with the kaijin, who revealed his alias to be Kajira. After All Might knocked the kaijin away with a Detroit smash, the kaijin unleashed a beam at them, which they narrowly escaped. At this point, Mirko was too injured to continue the fight, and was in danger of death should All Might continue to battle Gajira. So All Might took Mirko and escaped, likely saving her life in the process. The silence was now a constant companion in this room, and Aizawa felt himself growing slightly pale. For someone to be able to force Mirko to the point of death and match All Might in such a way that the only way to save Mirko was to retreat, was terrifying to think about. If this got out to the public, chaos was all too likely. But that isn't the main reason I brought you all here, Nezu said ominously. Then what is? Nimuri asked, and Nezu changed the screen to a set of numbers and readings. And Aizawa's heart sank. This can't be real. The energy that Kajira used, we believe it to be atomic. Aizawa looked into the eyes of his colleagues, each of them pale as they came to the same conclusion. This Kajira was essentially a walking atomic bomb. 
one strong enough to put some of the greatest heroes in Japan on their knees. Gajira. Six days later. America. Gajira snarled as he drove the head of another pro hero into the ground, cracks quickly spreading from the impact. These pro heroes are infuriating. I'm reaching the end of my patience and my wits. Standing up he looked at the four block radius of destruction around him, mountains leveled, houses destroyed, and all in between in ruins. Dozens of the pro heroes surrounded him. Injured and defeated, yet the only deaths belonged to the villains that had been idiotic enough to attack him in the beginning. Humanity is a pest, and these pro-heroes only make it worse. Far too idiotic and confident to bow down to the Alpha. I thought by traveling to another continent I could rest and relax. Instead, things get worse even faster. He snorted as he began to travel towards the ocean. Perhaps the home of the Fanged One will prove a better residence he muttered to himself as he readied to leave. Then the wind changed direction and a familiar scent entered Gajira's nose. What? Spinning around furiously, Gajira snarled and bared his teeth as he saw the source of the scent approach. It was him. An imposter. A fake. A pretender. In front of him, stood a smaller version of his kaiju form. The body was completely kaiju and gonzalosaurus in appearance, with not a hint of humanity's stain in it. Standing much taller than Gajira at around 13 feet tall. However, it wore clothes, white, red, and even more flamboyant than All Might's. Who are you, pretender? He growled narrowing his eyes. The pretender merely narrowed his own eyes, the growl of a kaiju emitting from his throat. I am the monster hero Godzilla, the number two hero of America and former number two of Japan. What is your name villain? Godzilla was clearly struggling to keep himself under control. This was likely his first time meeting another kaiju such as himself. And the want, the need, to prove himself stronger was something he had never felt before. Only number two. Second best. This pretender is pathetic already. A gonzalosaurus bows only to those stronger, and I bow to none. I am Gajira, king of the monsters, and you do not deserve to wield my flesh, my name, or my appearance. Gajira shouted angrily, as he rushed at Godzilla who did the same, both of them releasing a roar that shook the ground they clashed upon. S-H-R-R-E-E-O-O-N-N-K-K Izuku Midoriya Izuku sighed as he surfed the internet, looking for something entertaining or interesting to watch. Stopping as he came across a new live stream from a channel called Warrior Dome which was devoted to showcasing unedited live battles between heroes and villains. They usually had several streams active at once and had more than 20 million subscribers. However, it was the name of this new stream that made him pause. Rise of Kajira. Who's that? Izuku wondered as he started the live stream. The first thing that Izuku saw was complete destruction. Everything around was obliterated and in ruins. That's America Izuku realized seeing the location in the top right corner of the screen. S-H-R-R-E-E-O-O-N-N-N-K-K Izuku's eyes widened as the battle of Godzilla, and someone whom he guessed was Gajira, came into focus. The duo charged at one another, clashing with enough force to create a shockwave of power. Acting quickly, Gajira swung his tail around whacking Godzilla in the head and sending the number two stumbling away. Wait Gajira has a tail. Izuku brought out his notebook and narrowed his eyes as he studied Gajira. He was around seven feet tall with a muscular frame and scars across his arms. Just like Godzilla, he had a reptilian tail, which seemed to be ten feet in length. In fact, Gajira's tail was an almost identical copy of Godzilla's tail, even sharing the dorsal plates along its back. However, unlike Godzilla, Gajira's dorsal plates didn't reach his back. Gajira's forearms were covered in black scales, with small black spines growing from the sides. His hair was long, black, and unstyled, reaching to the bottom of his shoulder plates, which were also covered in black scales, along with the tops of his shoulders and sides of his neck. He also seemed to have gills in those scales at the sides of his neck. As Gajira charged at Godzilla, the number two spun around and slapped Gajira in the side of the head, making the villain stumble back and shake his head. Godzilla pressed on his advantage and rushed at Gajira, barreling into the villain's stomach and picking him up. With a roar of rage, Gajira brought his right elbow down into Godzilla's back, and the number two crumbled to the ground. However, the monster hero recovered quickly and attempted to sweep Gajira's feet out from under him, but Gajira leaped away, avoiding it. Pathetic. You fight like a newborn. Gajira taunted, as Godzilla snarled, and you fight like an animal. Gajira narrowed his eyes and again charged towards Godzilla, who took a wide fighting stance and braced himself for the impact as Gajira collided with him. Acting quickly, Godzilla allowed the force of Gajira to pass over him and spun around, kicking Gajira's feet out from under him, who released a short, angry yelp of surprise as he hit the ground. Moving quickly, Godzilla slammed his tail into Gajira's head, a shockwave erupting from the impact, knocking Gajira out cold. Then, in his trademark style, Godzilla placed his right foot on Gajira's chest and roared to the heaven. S-H-R-E-E-O-O-O-N-N-N-K-K-K. Izuku sighed in relief, he had started to get worried. 
And as the live stream began to switch off, Izuku, nor anyone else, noticed the blue wisps that were rising from Gajira's forearms. Gajira. S-H-R-E-E-O-O-O-N-N-N-K-K-K. -K -K. Gajira awoke in an instant, his eyes snapping open as the roar of Godzilla rang in his ears. The next moment, Gajira realized what was happening. Godzilla was claiming victory. And the next, rage filled him like a rush of adrenaline, boiling his blood and filling him with a primal strength. Summoning his atomic energy, Gajira narrowed his eyes as Godzilla looked down at him, surprise quickly covering his face. Then with a roar, Gajira tossed Godzilla off him, a shockwave of atomic energy exploding around them as he did, getting to his feet. Gajira snarled at Godzilla as his atomic energy emitted from his kaijin parts. How dare you! Gajira snarled as he began to walk towards Godzilla. Before charging at Godzilla the wind alone pushing the monster hero back, I have thought bigger. I have killed worse. You are nothing. With every word, Kajira slammed his fists into Godzilla, blue shockwaves of fiery atomic energy exploding around them with every blow. Kajira's eyes glowed the same color as his atomic energy, as he picked up Godzilla by the throat and filled his lungs with atomic energy. But before he could destroy the imposter, a voice, young and desperate, crying out from afar, Dad. No. Swinging his head, Kajira saw a young hybrid running towards them. They had the dorsal plates and tail of Godzilla yet lacked the scales everywhere else. With a start, Kajira realized who he was looking at. JR. JR. Run. Godzilla yelled, barely able to speak or even breathe, as he struggled to free himself from Kajira's grip. Yet, Kajira didn't notice, didn't respond. All he could do was stare at JR, frozen in place as realization crashed down upon him. In a moment, he saw himself from JR's perspective, a villain, a destructive force of evil, about to take away whom he loved, and it all came crashing down. He was just like them just like Ghidorah, Kaiser, Destroya, and all those whom he had fought. No, I won't become them. I will not orphan a child. Dropping Godzilla, Kajira fell to his knees, pride, rage, sorrow, and regret warring within him. He had killed few since coming, a mercy he didn't recognize welling up within him whenever the heroes laid at his feet, a mercy he had only felt when he had defeated those he would now call his allies and even his friends. What good does that promise do? How many have I already orphaned? In the eyes of how many have I become a villain? Kajira looked up and watched as JR ran between him and Godzilla, spreading his arms to either side and baring his teeth. Stay away from my dad. JR shouted. What have I become? No, now was not the time to question oneself. Kajira shook his head and stood up. Light bruises all that hindered him as he walked towards the heavily injured Godzilla, but stopped as JR snarled, holding up his hands in a peace treaty. He said, I apologize to you JR and Godzilla, but if you want your father to survive, then you need my help. JR scoffed but a glimmer of fear remained in his eyes. Your help. You're the one who did this to him in the first place. Kajira nodded. I did. But the fact remains that I am the only one who can save your father's life. He will die before assistance arrives. JR's eyes widened and he glanced back at Godzilla, fear now apparent on his face. Kajira felt his patience wear thin. He didn't have time for this. Stomping forward, he pushed JR aside, earning a yelp of surprise from the young Kaijin and kneeled beside Godzilla, whose breath was becoming more and more shallow with every moment. Taking a deep breath, he channeled his unique atomic energy gently into his hands. Placing them onto the hero's chest, he sent a weak yet constant flow of kaiju atomic energy into Godzilla. What are you doing? JR asked slowly as he walked up beside him, and watched on in wonder as the blue energy illuminated Godzilla's veins. Within seconds Kajira saw his work produce fruit. And no sooner did he end the flow, taking his hands off of the hero's chest, I channeled a small amount of my unique radiation directly into Godzilla's body. Such a thing would kill a normal person, but for a kaiju, it does the opposite. JR didn't respond or question Gajira's actions. And as Godzilla's breath became even and clear, the burns and bruises on his body quickly fading. I'm surprised that JR is acting so calmly right now. I did just try to kill his father after all. Perhaps it's a factor of this world or his upbringing. But either way, it likely saved Godzilla's life. Standing up, Kajira turned around and began his journey back to the ocean. Where are you going? Stopping, Kajira glanced back to see JR standing like him, still between himself and Godzilla. I have no reason to remain here. He answered blandly, but JR shook his head. You're wrong. If you run now, you'll never stop. Not until you die. Kajira frowned at JR's words. And what other course do I have? I am already a villain in the eyes of the world. JR nodded. True, but villains can become heroes. And your heart is good. Stay with me and I can help you change. Both Kajira and JR looked at Godzilla as he sat up, tired from the battle but clearly awake and rational. I attempted to kill you, and have put many heroes in the literal ground. Kajira said gesturing to the dozen heroes behind him, quite a few stuck in the said ground like an ostrich. Godzilla winced. Besides, why would you trust me? He asked, and this time Godzilla answered quickly, JR is never wrong. If he trusts someone, I trust them. Kajira scoffed. 
What kind of logic is that? And Godzilla chuckled, surprisingly solid. And you did save my life after all. This is intriguing. These two are far too trusting. Almost unbelievably so. But if JR's trust truly carries that much weight with Godzilla, perhaps I can find a way home. Fine, I will stay with you. But I doubt I'll change. Twenty minutes later, Gajira could only growl as the detective paced back and forth in front of him. Look, Gajira I want to help you. So just tell us who you are, where you came from, and why you attacked the heroes. From the detective's tone, he was getting impatient. Sighing, Gajira repeated himself for what felt like the tenth time. I have many names, but humanity calls me Gajira. I awoke in Japan, and I attacked the heroes because they challenged me. A lie detector can only detect so much. Tell the truth but never what they want to hear. Gajira was being held in a police station for questioning on his actions, which was a necessity apparently for his relief of public enemy status. If it wasn't for JR and Godzilla, I would have raised this mud hut and this insect back to the dirt from whence they came. The detective flinched, and Gajira smirked. The detective had the ability to sense hostility and predict the thoughts of others based on their physical actions and reactions, which meant he had a good idea about what he was currently thinking about. After a short staring competition between himself and the detective said detective threw his hands in the air in defeat. Fine, I give up. He win. Gajira chuckled in triumph and said, I can tell you this, my only enemies are those who challenge me or the natural order. Godzilla. Godzilla sighed as the detective left Gajira alone in the questioning room. He is a variable, unknown, and powerful. Godzilla winced as he moved his right shoulder, the burns of his clash with Gajira still evident. Endeavor's flames didn't hurt nearly as much. Hell, I haven't felt pain like this since all might. Godzilla, you have a call. It's private a police said, holding out a phone. Nodding in thanks, Godzilla took the phone and headed to the corner of the room, where he wouldn't be heard. Hello, hey Godzilla, how you doing? Godzilla couldn't help the grin that broke out across his face as he heard the familiar feminine voice. Kathleen, finally get off your ass to check up on me. Har har. Very funny number two and again, Godzilla couldn't stop the twitch of his right eye and the flare of annoyance and anger at the taunt. Despite what the media may portray, Godzilla wasn't happy being number two. It wasn't like Endeavor's rivalry with All Might that bordered on hostility and hate, but more of a hatred of being below someone else, being weaker than someone else. What is it? He asked, his tone no doubt informing Kathleen of his annoyance. Geez, sorry buddy. I just wanted to know about this Kajira guy. Heard that he beat you, and a ton of other pro heroes in one sitting. I don't know much more than what the file says Godzilla lied. But Kathleen didn't relent, you and I both know you're hiding something. We're trying to get in touch with Yue as we speak, so if you have anything to say, say it quickly. Kathleen warned, and he sighed in defeat. Hidden? Hidden Gajira's quirk is a lot more than what I told them. How much more? Godzilla sighed. Atomic. Kathleen was silent for a while. He's what? Gajira has atomic energy. Kathleen. He did more than beat me. He put me on death's door in seconds and dragged me away just as quickly. It's unlike anything I've ever seen. I got someone to measure it, and it was off the fucking scale. This guy's got the power of a walking thermonuclear bomb, maybe more. Kathleen was silent for even longer this time, and when she spoke again, her voice was shaky worry clear within it, yet anger was the most prominent emotion. Are you telling me that there is a living nuke in my city? Godzilla winced, yes. Are you fucking kidding me? What the hell Godzilla why the fuck would you keep a living fucking nuke hidden from us? If he wanted us dead, I would already be. He saved my life Kathleen, he. Gave me some of his unique radiation, it healed me. Godzilla listened patiently as Kathleen calmed down, taking deep breaths as she muttered her calming mantra. Where is he now? Godzilla frowned. Why do you want to know? If I use new order on him, I can remove any possible nuclear threat he poses. Godzilla was shocked. You can't do that. Sure he's beaten the shit out of dozens of heroes, but he's not a bad guy. And you won't be able to use your quirk while the rule's active. Not unless you dismiss your super strength. And if you're wrong... What then? How many bodies would you be responsible for? Godzilla sighed. Too many. But, when he saw JR, JR was there. Is he okay? Yeah. Actually JR is another reason why I'm still alive. When Gajira saw JR, he froze. He went from a rampaging monster to a broken man in seconds. Not that it lasted. Yeah so, I think that JR changed Gajira's perspective, made him realize what he was doing. That and JR trusted him to heal me. So I trust him. Well, what do you plan to do with Gajira anyway? The new goal program isn't exactly easy. Gajira's going to need a pro that can beat him to watch and train him. And you didn't exactly beat him. Godzilla turned to look at Gajira who was banging his head against the metal bench in boredom. Maybe, maybe not. What's that mean? To the public, Godzilla came out on top. And JR did stop him once already. You said it yourself, Gajira is a nuclear threat. But he doesn't have to be. Gajira did say that his only enemies are those that challenge him or the natural order after all. Don't tell me. Godzilla chuckled. Then you shouldn't listen. 
because I am going to train Kajira to become a hero. As he watched Namuji battle, he couldn't help but smile. Such power, such ferocity, and savagery. Who would have known a kaiju would be so powerful? Yet as the video progressed, his smile quickly turned into a frown as he watched Namuji not only spare Godzilla, but heal him and allow himself to be brought to questioning. Kudai, what is this? Why isn't Namuji acting as it should? He asked, annoyance growing within him. It seems that the source of Namuji's unpredicted behavior is JR, the son of Godzilla. Kudai's voice said, swapping to a live feed of G talking with Godzilla and JR, an unhappy expression on his face. So Namuji has connections to JR. He asked, it would seem that way. However, the lack of JR in Namuji's home world suggests that something happened to him. There is a very real possibility that the kaiju JR died if he ever existed in the first place. Should we terminate JR? He shook his head. No if Namuji discovers the truth, he will become a direct enemy. And if JR was his son in his own world, then we will be angering him directly. And a kaiju's fury is something no fool desires. Instead, I believe we will begin the process of creating something with the power to kill Namuji very well. Which body should I begin? He chuckled, remembering one particular Namu. That proved the most deadly of all. Begin work on Namu Zero very well. Master the video feed cut off and he chuckled as he leaned back. Soon, my plan will begin. And the world will become mine once more, even if I have to share it. Gajira. Day 1 of the new goals program. Gajira frowned at the garments in front of him. What are these? He asked as he held them up. They were similar to the clothes that he had seen civilians wear, but different as well. There was a black pair of jeans that had a hole in the back for his tail, a pair of black boots and socks, and a black singlet with what appeared to be his kaiju form moving in a spiral. They're your hero outfit, for now at least. Strong, sturdy and they can actually withstand your atomic energy. Godzilla said, his own hero outfit already donned. And the symbol, he asked, and Godzilla frowned. It's the same thing that's on your back. Gajira frowned, huh, rolling his eyes. Godzilla brought out a mirror, and using its reflection showed the exact same symbol on his own back. Strange, Gajira muttered. It doesn't matter right now. Just get changed, we're going out on patrol. As Godzilla headed for the door, he looked back and said, oh, and try to behave today. Twelve minutes later. Why? Gajira asked, confused and slightly annoyed as he held the thief over the edge of the bridge with his tail. We don't kill villains or criminals. Not if we have any choice. Godzilla explained, a small light of panic in his eyes. Kajira rolled his own. Seriously? What kind of moron made that rule? Evil deserves no mercy, hence we kill it. He felt like he was explaining this to a child. And it was very irritating. Yes, seriously. I don't know. And if we don't show mercy how are we any better than them? Godzilla answered and asked at the same time. Kajira groaned, shaking his head, and making the thief yelp, crying and sobbing in fear. Of course, we're better than them. We don't go around destroying the natural order. We don't steal and we don't kill innocents. Not on purpose at least. Godzilla seemed to notice the last part. And looked at Kajira with a blank expression. We don't ever kill innocents Kajira. And that man is innocent. He doesn't deserve to die. Kajira groaned again. Before tossing the thief over Godzilla's head. The hero's head instantly followed the flying criminal. And after a satisfying crack. The thief screamed in pain as his legs were shattered by a passing truck. Godzilla's head shot back to Gajira anger clear on his face, and Gajira shrugged, oops. Two hours later, Gajira laughed maniacally as he charged through the gang's base. Using his tail he launched one thug through the roof, and then with a backhand snapped another's neck. Come on, he shouted, as he charged a weak atomic pulse, and with a boom, disintegrated the remaining thugs, instantly killing them. Gajira, he sighed loudly as Godzilla ran up next to him, eyeing the carnage around them. I told you, we don't kill. We're not murderers. Rolling his eyes, Gajira gestured around, this isn't murder. Godzilla scoffed. Then what is it? Looking at the hero, Gajira smirked evilly, collateral damage and then proceeded to walk past the shocked hero, towards the street, hurry up. Wouldn't want more collateral would you? Twenty minutes later, his left eye twitched constantly as annoyance and boiling anger rose quickly within him. Godzilla can we get a comment? Why are you working with Gajira? What is your connection to Gajira? What's Gajira's quirk? What happened in there? Is Gajira a danger to us? Flashes of light and constant voices from the reporters served to quickly get on his nerves. If this continues I'm about to make them all collateral. Godzilla held up his hands. The battle with Gajira was a large misunderstanding. He had negative experiences with pro heroes in the past and was attacked by them as such. Gajira's quirk is listed as Kaijin in the database and he is currently undergoing the new goals program in an attempt to continue his goals of defending the natural order. That is all. Kidzillo then unleashed a mighty roar and slammed his tail into the ground which kicked up a massive amount of dust. Once it cleared, it revealed that Kidzillo was gone. 
He wasn't. Fucking bastard abandoned me. As the reporters turned their attention to Gajira, he looked around, saw a building, and leaped to it, before climbing up its side by creating handholds with his claws. Forty minutes later, Gajira scowled, anger mounting as he roamed around the streets of America. Ever since Godzilla had made his flashy exit, he hadn't been able to find the monster hero, and as such he was now lost in the city. I swear I'm going to make sushi out of him. Mommy, where are you? Kajira stopped and glanced at the source of the voice. Standing there, at the side of the street, was a young white girl no older than five, sitting down hugging her knees, with short snow-white hair, and a pair of equally white feathered wings sprouting from her back covering her like a shield. She wore a pair of yellow shorts and a white t-shirt. His gaze softening, Kajira walked over to the girl, crossing the busy road as he did. Finally, as he reached her, he kneeled down to look her in the eye, before speaking in as soft a voice as he could manage. Hello there. The girl looked up in mild surprise, and her eyes quickly widened at him. Here she stuttered, Kajira slowly reached out his right hand. Humans are fragile, especially the children, so be slow, gentle, and calm when interacting with them. Remember that Kajira, recalling Godzilla's words, and his own children, Kajira nodded slightly, take my hand, I can help you find your mother. The girl hesitated, but finally took his hand in her own her wings opening and folding at her back. With a small start, Kajira realized her eyes were black as the night sky, yet within them, constellations seemed to glimmer and shine. Okay, the girl said as Kajira helped her to her feet, before looking around. Can you tell me what your mother looks like? He asked gently, and the girl nodded. She looks just like me, but she's black instead of white. Kajira frowned, confused for a moment before he remembered something Godzilla had warned him about. Is this little girl racist? Seemingly noticing his strange expression, the girl quickly explained, No I mean, mommy is actually black. Her wings and hair are both black, but her skin's even whiter than mine. Kajira mentally sighed. Should have just led with that kid. What's your name? Kajira asked as he scanned the surroundings for any sight of the girl's mother. Gabriel, my name is Gabriel, she said, her voice quiet. Gabriel, if I remember was one of the archangels. The inspiration for this one's name is clear. Okay Gabriel, do you have anything that belongs to your mother? He asked, and after a moment, Gabriel nodded holding out a small piece of paper. Kajira frowned as he took and unfolded it. Human language was written across it, but he didn't understand it. Do you know what this says? He asked, but Gabriel shook her head. I can't read it. Kajira's frown deepened. If you can't read it, then why did your mother give it to you? He brought it to his nose and inhaled its scent, and his confusion deepened. It didn't carry the scent of a female, nor a mother, or anything resembling Gabriel's scent, but a male, overflowing with the stench of oil and junk food. A strange man gave it to me, saying that it belonged to my mom. He stopped as he stared at Gabriel, realization dawning on him. Is this child truly that stupid? This isn't her mother's. It's her kidnapper's, and it almost certainly holds a threat or ransom of some sort. Folding the paper and placing it in his pocket, Gajira looked around. We need to find a hero. He muttered, follow me Gabriel, and stay close. Ten minutes later, Gajira, with Gabriel in tow, walked up to the female hero. You, human, Gajira demanded, catching the woman's attention. She was around six fur and had long spiky blonde hair. Her outfit was striped and closely resembled the American flag, as well as giving him a faint sense of deja vu. Where have I seen this style before? As the hero turned to him, her eyes widened and she jumped. Clearly she recognized him. Gajira, what are you doing here? Where's Godzilla? She asked, and Gajira frowned, I don't know where he is, but I'm here because I need your assistance. He moved Gabriel in front of him. This young girl's mother is missing, and a man left her this note. He handed the woman the note, and after opening it, her eyes widened further. This isn't good. She muttered, what does it say? He asked, getting impatient already. The woman glanced at Gabriel, before kneeling down in front of her, do you know who I am? She asked, and Gabriel after inspecting the woman's face for a moment, lit up in excitement. Literally, her body began to glow completely. Your star and stripe, America's number one hero. Gabriel squealed, making Gajira shake his head from the high-pitched sound. The number one, the hero who stands above Godzilla. She doesn't seem like much. Star and stripe nodded and pointed to a nearby hero who saluted them. I need you to go with Siren. He'll look after you while I find your mother. Gabriel slowly dimmed a look of disappointment on her face. What? Is something wrong with mom? She asked, and Star and stripe shook her head. No, your mom's just lost. So be big and strong while I go get her. Okay. Gabriel nodded slowly and turned to walk up to Siren, who seemed to be wearing an outfit from the ancient Egyptians. As soon as Gabriel took Siren's hand, they both vanished, making him flinch. Kajira then watched as Star and Stripe turned around and prepared to leave. You're not leaving without me, Stripe. Star and Stripe paused and glanced back at Kajira. And why can't I? Her voice carried a hint of challenge, which he took badly. 
Stripey wants to challenge me. Fine, I'll put her in her place. Taking a fighting stance, Kajira narrowed his eyes as he looked at Star and Stripe, who nearly did the same. Yet she paused yet again, and sighed, her hostility fading. Look, Kajira, I apologize. We shouldn't fight. I'll let you help. Kajira scoffed. Let me help. Please you couldn't stop me if you tried. Star and Stripe flinched at his words but didn't react. This paper is a ransom. Someone's kidnapped Gabriel's mother and are holding her at the docks. Kajira nodded, as I suspected. That is all. He turned in the direction of the sea and readied to leave when Star and Stripe stepped in front of him. Not that way, the docks are over there. Kajira frowned, turning his gaze to the small river that ran around the small island. I knew that, he said storming off in the direction of the docks. Forty minutes later, Kajira scowled as Star and Stripe explained the plan for the tenth time. I'll cause a distraction. That way you can save Artemis. I don't need a plan, mortal. Give up. Star and Stripe sighed, pinching her nose. We don't want them to kill Artemis, so unless you have a better plan, this is what we're doing. Kajira narrowed his eyes. I do. Annihilation. At his answer, Star and Stripe groaned, for the last time. Annihilation is not a strategy. Yes, it is he answered, and the heroine rolled her eyes. How so? Kajira pointed at the cargo dock, where Artemis was being held. A sudden attack, without restraint or concern for damage, will catch your enemies off guard and strip them of any chance to prepare or retaliate in full. Panic, fear, and confusion can be the greatest weapons in one's arsenal. Star and Stripe blinked for a moment, before muttering in the midst of chaos, there is also opportunity. Kajira nodded, indeed. And the more chaos we cause, the lesser chance there is of any attention remaining on Artemis. Star and Stripe mirrored his action. What do you know, you're not as dumb as you look. Kajira narrowed his eyes. Watch your tongue or I'll rip it out. Now, wait for my signal. Then he took off towards the bay. What signal? Star and Stripe called, but he didn't respond, leaping into the water. With a sinister smirk on his face, as Gajira sunk beneath the waves, not a ripple was made by him on his journey to the end of the dock. Slowly, deliberately he arrived at his destination and leaped up onto the dock, water dripping off him as he unleashed his roar. He drove his right foot into the ground with enough force to shake the entire dock. S-H-R-E-E-O-O-O-N-N-N-K-K-K The effect was almost instantaneous. Shouts and cries of panic and surprise rang true through the air, and soon a rain of bullets crashed down upon him. Bullets, pathetic. The projectiles merely flattened against his skin, ineffective as they were useless. It didn't take long for the kidnappers to realize this, as soon they were rushing down to meet him head on. Slamming his tail into the ground, again shaking the dock, he pulsed with atomic energy, releasing an intimidation display that caused hesitation in multiple of the humans. Come and meet your death. He shouted as he charged at them. Get him. One of the humans shouted, as they charged at him. Meeting the humans with a burst of power, Kajira instantly killed several of the closest among them, their corpses becoming charred, and one even being completely disintegrated. Oh shit. One of the humans yelled in panic, but he didn't have time to escape, as Gajira roared and plunged his tail into the human's stomach, causing the human to scream in agony. Gajira slammed him into another human with enough force to instantly kill both. Using his hands, he grabbed another human's arms and tore both out of their sockets before shoving them into two other humans' chests, making them cough up blood and gut. Then returning to the disarmed one, he tore out his throat and shoved it into his mouth, leaving a gory hole when he tore his fist out of the corpse. Turning to the remaining humans, who stared in horror and fear at him, he released another atomic pulse, disintegrating the corpses and all the evidence, leaving only ash and fire in their place. Rushing at the humans, he bitch-slapped one so hard his neck spun and his corpse was thrown into the bay, grabbed another by the leg and smashed him down into the ground with enough force to reduce him to a blood stain and a leg, and proceeded to plunge the leg into the final man's skull, before releasing another atomic pulse to once again erase any evidence of the slaughter. Don't need Stripey and Godzilla on my tail. What they don't know won't hurt them. Seeing no survivors, Gajira sniffed the air and picked up on a female's scent, similar yet different to Gabriel's, with fear and panic staining the smell, huffed and rushed in her direction, finally coming across a guarded, and chain metal crate, Gajira scoffed as the two guards pointed in his direction two guns. They never learn. But before he could react, two missiles rocketed in his direction, exploding in his face and sending him flying back. Bitches, crashing into a storage crate, Gajira grunted as he felt the force of impact crash into him. Now he was pissed, growling as he stepped out of the hole he had created in the crate's side. He turned around, picked up the crate, and tossed it at the two guards, who screamed in shock and barely avoided being crushed by the crate. But they only ended up rolling right into his grasp, as with a swift movement, he plunged his claws into their spines and tore them clean out, instantly killing both of them. After another atomic pulse, he walked over to the crate's chains, tearing them off easily. He ripped the doors off their hinges and tossed them behind him, revealing an unconscious woman trapped inside. 
The first thing he noticed was the four large black feathered wings that sprouted from her back, two large ones and two smaller ones directly below them. With a curvaceous body, which would no doubt turn many human heads, her long black hair was smooth and flowing, likely reaching down to her waist when she stood. Her skin was a pearl white, yet it shimmered black in certain places. Surprisingly, she wore a hero's outfit, a pitch black leotard covering her chest, black thigh highs, long black gloves, and armored heels. Armor was apparent on all of her clothes, not just her heels, giving the outfit a more battle-ready appearance. And a constant across the entire outfit, stars were displayed in a constellation pattern. How peculiar. Artemis seems to be a hero. Kajira, did you find her? Kajira looked behind him as Star and Stripe appeared. And as her eyes flickered to the unconscious form of Artemis, they widened. Nix, she asked, pushing past Kajira and promptly ignoring his warning growl. She walked up beside Artemis, Nix. I thought her name was Artemis. Who is this Nix? He asked curiously. Nix is a hero like me, the number five in America. No one knows who she is, since she kept her identity a secret from most. Until now. Kajira raised an eyebrow as he inspected the heroine. Nix is Artemis' secret persona, although how she remains hidden without any kind of face covering is beyond me. Not to mention the wings. If she was the number 5 heroine, then the power of you heroes must decline quickly as your number descends. He scoffed, yet Star and Stripe glared at him. Nix isn't a physical fighter like Godzilla and me. Her quirk is called Eternal Night. It lets her create and manipulate shadow and darkness alike. Kajira pointed at her wings. And how did she keep herself hidden with the wings? Star and Stripe shrugged. There are a lot of people with animal mutations in America, so it wouldn't have been hard. Kajira rolled his eyes. Well, we found her. Let's take her back to Gabriel and be done. Star and Stripe nodded, and picking up Nyx, she followed Kajira out of the crate. Oh, I forgot. Kajira. Kajira rolled his eyes as he looked at Star and Stripe. What? She pointed to the rest of the dock. What happened to the rest of the kidnappers? Kajira chose not to answer that one with anything else but a shrug. Three hours later. Where have you been? Godzilla shouted as Kajira narrowed his eyes. They were in the hospital where Artemis was being treated for her injuries. Star and Stripe had left to get Gabriel, and Kajira was left alone to wait for Godzilla to arrive. After your little vanishing act, I couldn't find you again. So I wandered around, found a little girl, she gave me a note, found Stripey, and saved her mother from kidnappers. Happy, Kajira growled, making Godzilla hesitate. Did you hurt anybody? Godzilla asked, and Gajira nodded. I haven't caused a single injury. I created several. On multiple occasions, on numerous would-be corpses. Godzilla sighed in relief. That's good to hear. Good job Gajira. Gajira nodded, smirking. Yes, good job me. So how's the mother? Godzilla asked, and Gajira shrugged, pointing with his tail towards the room in which the heroine was currently resting in. In there, unconscious last I checked, Gajira said, which was a blatant lie. Artemis had woken up a minute ago. He just didn't care to talk to her. Godzilla raised an eyebrow and walked towards Artemis' room, opening it and revealing the heroine awake in all her glory and definitely confused and irritated. However, those emotions vanished once she saw them. Godzilla, what are you doing here? And who's that next to you? She asked, frowning at Gajira, who frowned in response. Artemis' voice was laced with a royalty and tone he had only ever felt from the winged one herself, soft and kind, a masterfully hidden confidence and power masked underneath, only known to the few who had experienced even a tenth of what he had. A voice like this could easily change, becoming authoritative and powerful. It solves her voice, but the face is still a mystery. Oh well, doesn't matter. This is Gajira. He's undergoing the new goals system since we fought a while back. Artemis raised an eyebrow, and Gajira narrowed his eyes as he saw Artemis, the polar opposite of Gabriel's. Hers glowed with light like the sun. So you want to be a hero. You got what it takes. Gajira nodded, and Artemis continued. Why do you want to be a hero anyway? Godzilla looked at Gajira, curious as well, and Gajira sighed, to protect that which no one else will. Nature, the natural order of all things, and the world as a whole. Artemis chuckled, haven't heard that one before. But you're right, nature does need a protector. Gajira shook his head. I am not its protector in truth. I am its wrath, the force that restores the order and destroys any who disrupt it. Godzilla patted Gajira's shoulder. Gajira helped Star and Stripe save you. Apparently he was the one who found your daughter and brought her to safety. Artemis' eyes widened and she looked at Gajira. Really? You? Thanks then. Her eyes trailed up and down his frame, and she licked her lips. How could I repay you? She asked with a casual stretch that showcased her curvaceous figure. Gajira, despite himself, found his own eyes lingering on her curves and shook his head. What the hell is this? You don't, was his short answer. And at his words, Artemis deflated a little, but quickly recovered as she licked her lips. Well if you ever reconsider, you're welcome anytime. Gajira blinked and shifted his stance uncomfortably. Why the hell am I feeling this way? What the fuck is the human doing to me? 
Godzilla glanced at him out of the corner of his eye and returned his gaze to Artemis. Artemis, please stop flirting with him. He's my responsibility, and he's got enough strength to best me. Artemis' eyebrows raised at Godzilla's words, and a strange smile appeared on her face. Even better, again Artemis licked her lips, and Gajira shivered, turned around, and left the room. Once he closed the door, he compared Artemis to the winged one, and the rabbit heroine he'd beaten up when he first awoke. Finally, he concluded, females are weird. Three weeks later, Kajira sighed as he dangled a laughing JR six feet in the air by the feet using his tail. So, have you decided on where you want to go now? Godzilla asked not showing the slightest hint of concern for JR's safety as they both inspected the papers in front of him. Files and photos detailing his options for progression in the hero's career, which was essential to achieving his goals. They had all been translated into Latin so that he could actually read them. Why Latin? Masui asked sitting next to Godzilla. Masui was Godzilla's wife and the mother of JR. She too was a pro hero, the number four in America, and bore a striking resemblance to the winged one. If the winged one took on a humanoid form, according to Godzilla, Masui was an absolute knockout. Sexy and beautiful were the words used to describe her by anyone with eyes, although they rarely said those words in Godzilla's presence. She had two large moth wings which would glow whenever she used her quirk of luminescence. Aside from that, she shared little in common with the winged one, aside from her personality. Kajira can read four different languages, all of them ancient, none of them modern. He can read Latin, ancient Egyptian, Sumerian, and Atlantian right. Godzilla listed the final language sarcastically, and Masui chuckled, Atlantian? You're joking right. Kajira shook his head. Not at all. Atlantian was a very real language from where I was raised. More like a picture book sometimes than an actual language, but still a language. Masui looked at Godzilla with a questioning gaze and Godzilla nodded. I didn't believe him either, not until he wrote down more than 90 pages worth of information about the Atlantian language. Couldn't understand a single thing, but it was there. Send it off to get appraised by a museum and it's a legit language. Not confirmed to be Atlantian but still a legit language. This guy knows Atlantian. A fucking mythical language, but he can't read English. Gajira rolled his eyes as he picked up another file labeled UA. It took me many years to learn Atlantian since I was never a good learner, so it'll take a while to learn your English writing. As he went through the pages of the file, Godzilla seemed to recognize the photo on the cover. That's UA, the most prestigious hero school in Japan. That's where I was taught. If you're going anywhere, that's the best, trust me. Gajira raised an eyebrow as he went through the staff list and stopped as he saw a very familiar face. All Might. So this, All Might teaches at UA. Godzilla nodded somewhat hesitantly. Likely he'd learned of his previous encounter with the number one hero of Japan. Yeah, but, UA's really strict, you know. So maybe you shouldn't Kajira pulled the file away from Godzilla's outstretched hand. A smirk on his face as the thought of a rematch played in his head. I'm sure I can handle it. You did say all of these schools were ready to take on members of the new goals program. Kidzillo gulped and nodded, while Masui seemed to be trying to hold back a laugh. So I think I'll go to this one. You know, because of your recommendation. Standing up, Kajira dropped the file on the table and JR on the ground next to him and walked off laughing maniacally, his own laughter soon followed by Masui's. Later that day, you sure about this? I could put a word in for you with some local hero schools. Besides you don't even know if you'll get in. Kidzillo said, worry and dread clearly filling him as Kajira chuckled evilly, I'm sure. And if I don't get in, I'll just come back here. No problems. Hearing the tone in his latter words, Godzilla seemed to sink with dread. You're going to be the death of me. Kajira smirked and patted Godzilla on the back, probably. Well, I'm off. Stepping away from the monster hero, he nodded in farewell to JR, Masui, Gabriel and Artemis, who had come to see him off. Turning around, he leaped into the ocean and began the long journey back to Japan, with only one goal in mind. And that goal was to introduce his fist to All Might's balls. All Might. A feeling of dread crept up his spine and All Might shivered, feeling cold. Midnight taunted, but he shook his head. Just a feeling. What kind? All Might turned his gaze to the ceiling, a feeling like someone was walking over my grave. Kajira. Four days later, Kajira sighed in boredom as he walked down the streets of Japan. Having arrived earlier that day, it had been a simple task of tracking down a nearby hero and informing them about his completion of the new goals program. Once that was done he was no longer listed as a criminal and all active heroes would know that, as long as they picked up their phone. This meant two things, one good, and the other boring. First, if he was attacked by a hero, he had every right to retaliate and wouldn't suffer any consequences. But that was ultimately useless given that. Second, he wasn't getting attacked at every turn, so he could actually travel efficiently, which was boring. So, as Gajira continued his path down the street, a kid wearing a hero suit crashed into him. Yet Gajira didn't even flinch, opting to glare at the new arrival O. 
Forgive me the kid trailed off as he looked at Kajira, shock and fear rising on his face. The kid was rather tall, more than six feet, and had relatively short blue hair. He wore a pair of glasses that clashed rather oddly with his choice of attire. A white armor-like suit with metal pipes coming out of his calves and others rising from his waist and ending behind his shoulders. His scent was similar to an engine, likely meaning that the metal pipes sprouting from his calves were a form of mutation. However, fear, panic, and adrenaline were mixed within it, and not from him. Calm down boy, I'm not an enemy. He was about to leave when something stopped him. An instinct that told him to help. Sighing, Gajira looked at the boy. Who was stuttering like a broken engine, why were you running? The boy shook his head, I can't tell you that. All that you need to know, is that I need to leave. Now, I need to get help. Gajira raised an eyebrow. Ah, assistance, since he doesn't trust me with it, it's likely connected to the endangerment of his friends. Taking a whiff of the boy's scent, he caught several others, yet one of them made him scowl. It was unnatural, faint, yet potent. Whatever it was, didn't belong in the natural order, and that made it his enemy. Stepping around the boy he said, don't let me stop you then boy, and continued walking, following the stench he had caught on the boy. Izuku Midoriya. It was a nightmare. Izuku could only watch in fear and shock as the Namu drove Aizawa's head into the ground. Without hesitation, he leaped out of the water and drew his right hand back aiming towards the decay villain who had his hand on Tsu. Crab, 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 crab. He's clearly different from our earlier opponents. I've gotta save Tsu and run away. Let go of her. The villain turned to look at him and as he channeled one for all into his arm he shouted, Smash! The force of the impact created numerous shockwaves of power, pushing everything back and destroying the lights that surrounded the USJ. Panting, Izuku felt something, or rather the lack of it. My arm's not broken. Can I really control my power at a time like this? I really did it. I did an actual smash. All right. But as Izuku looked up a flash of dread filled him as he saw the black Namu standing in front of him, not a mark on his body. When in the world, wait it didn't hurt him. As Izuku slowly pulled his arm back, he remembered what Su had said. Don't you think they're trying so hard because they have a way to kill him? No way. You move well. You're smash. Are you a follower of all mights? Oh well, I'm done with you. Izuku's eyes widened in fear as the Namu grabbed his arm and pulled him up. Raising its left hand it went to bring it down on his head and crush his skull. Play Godzilla Combat Suite by Star Wars Jibero. Without warning, the sound of breaking metal filled the air, as the doors to the USJ were thrown off their hinges, and the blackness of death never came. Opening his eyes, Izuku gasped, and the decay villain paused his hands inches away from Tsu and Maita's heads, just as the Namu's was from his own head. Walking from the dust and rubble caused by the entrance, a tall figure appeared, a long tail swinging behind him. Kajira, for it was indeed the Kaijin who stood before them. His red eyes briefly surveyed the USJ, before landing on them, or rather him. A growl emanated from Gajira's throat. His eyes narrowed in equal hostility and anger as the ominous blue glow that flashed from his dorsal plates and kaijin parts. Who are you? The decay villain asked, standing up and facing Gajira. The kaijin merely bared his teeth in response, your demise, was the kaijin's response, before he leaped at them, leaving a crater in his wake. The decay villain leaped out of the way, but it became clear that he wasn't Gajira's target. No, that privilege belonged to the Namu. With a yelp, Izuku leaped out of the way as Gajira slammed into the Namu pushing the behemoth up and away with ease. Kill him Namu, the decay villain shouted. I can watch the fight later, but first I need to save Tsu and Minta, moving as fast as he could. Izuku pulled Tsu out of the water and grabbed Minta before running to the others who stood at 13's side. Deku, are you okay? What's happening? Who's that? Hiroraka shouted in panic and confusion as she looked at the battle behind him. I'm fine. Villain showed up and is fighting the Namu Yuraraka's eyes widened. A villain? Why is he helping us? Izuku shook his head, I don't know. He turned around and his own eyes widened as he saw the clash between Kajira and the Namu. Kajira had the Namu on its back legs, striking with such a savage ferocity and hatred that Izuku had only seen before in clashes of rivals and nemesis. The duo traded blows, shockwaves destroying the ground below as they clashed. The Namu's unseen and invisible, but Kajira's were paired by blue bursts of energy that seemed to burn the Namu's skin. Namu cannot be killed. Shock absorption and regeneration make it invincible. The decay villain shouted, right as Gajira ripped off its arms and sent it flying with his tail before charging at the Namu. Yet before Gajira could reach the Namu, it yelled and its arms reappeared in moments. Regeneration. The Namu roared and tanked a blow from Gajira, before punching him in the face and sending the Kaijin flying. Quickly, it pursued Gajira as he tumbled. 
But with a single bash of his tail, Kajira stood once again and grabbed the Namu's hands wrestling with it. The ground below them cracked and shook from the collision, before with a shout Kajira kicked the Namu in its stomach making it double over in pain, before bringing his elbows down on its back with such force that he could hear the breaking of its bones. Is he winning? Izuku wondered as Kajira grabbed the Namu around its chest and tossed it into a wall, shaking the USJ as he did. Impossible. The decay villain shouted in shock and disbelief as he stumbled. Kajira didn't let up, and charged into the dust from the impact, vanishing as he did, for what seemed like an eternity. The only sound that emitted in the USJ was the constant shockwaves that shook it. Finally, a shadow was thrown from the dust, and Izuku felt his heart sink, it was Kajira, crashing into the ground in front of them. Gasps came from the others as Kajira rolled to their feet, breathing heavily from the injuries on his body, bruises most prominent among them, as he was bleeding from several places. Get up! Izuku thought, mentally willing the kaijin to stand, but laughter from the Namu and Decay villain tore his gaze away from the kaijin. How amusing. For another to stand up against Namu is definitely surprising. But you forget, Namu was created to kill the number one hero, to be the ultimate weapon. A backwater fighter isn't going to do shit. Izuku gulped, but before he could move he saw the shadow of the kaijin stand, and a dark chuckle came from Gajira. With shock Izuku realized that Gajira was completely healed. The only signs of his injuries being dried blood and dirt. Pathetic. The decay villain stumbled back in clear shock. Regeneration? Gajira snarled. That abomination doesn't deserve to exist. You, aunt, your very existence is disgraceful. I will end you both. Izuku's eyes widened as Gajira threatened death upon the villain. But the villain seemed to overcome his shock and pointed at Gajira. Kill them Namu, we're finished here. The Namu nodded and leaped at Gajira who didn't even move, instead slamming his tail into the ground a blue light began to hum from Kajira's dorsal plates, accompanied by the sound of a soft thrum with each glow, slowly growing louder as the light became brighter and reached up his tail. Izuku's hair stood on end, his instincts screamed danger as the air around was filled with a fierce, ancient, pressure. Finally, when the Nama was mere feet away from them, Kajira opened his jaw, and from it erupted a fiery blue beam of energy that collided with it. He breathes lasers. Izuku gasped, and his eyes quickly shifted to the Namu who was barely holding the energy back. It's still standing. But even as doubt filled Izuku once again, Kajira grunted in the force, light, and size of the beam. Doubled this time the Namu didn't stand a chance, for as soon as the larger beam reached it, it was swallowed completely, not even a hint of resistance left behind from it as the energy broke through the roof with ease. Namu, the decay villain shouted in panic as Gajira closed his mouth and the beam was cut off, vanishing completely. Izuku's eyes widened further as it revealed not a hint of the Namu. It was completely destroyed. He killed it. He actually killed it. He thought in disbelief as he stared at Gajira. What is he? Gajira. Gajira snorted as the ashes of the Namu were carried off by the wind, turning his gaze to the hand man. He snarled, the raging fire of wrath within him not yet satisfied. How dare they? These bugs, insects, pests, parasites, how dare they defile the most sacred of cycles, the most revered of orders, life and death. How dare they rip the limbs from the dead? How dare they create abominations from the dead? I will see them perish. He had never believed it possible. For humans, for anything, to defy the most sacred of orders, the order of life and death, of the circle of life. Once something was dead, it stayed dead. That was the law of the universe. Yet, now, the humans were creating living dead. A horrific, disgusting mash of limbs from the dead. They spat in the face of the very foundation of the balance and called them weapons. He had rarely been enraged as he was now. Few times before had he felt this burning anger. Clenching his jaw, he stared on as a living shadow appeared next to the hand one. They must be villains, but it matters not, they will burn like the rest. Die, Gajira yelled as he charged at the two, but before he could reach them the shadows swallowed them both, and they vanished, leaving only Gajira in their place. He growled, cowards, the retreat will only prolong their pain. As the wind changed direction, Gajira's eyes flinched and he jumped to the side as a figure slammed into where he had just been, dust and debris being tossed into the air from the impact, and a familiar figure stood in the dust glaring at him. So you're finally here. All Might. All Might glanced behind him, and his eyes widened as he saw the unconscious bodies of two fellow pro heroes. All Might's fists clenched and he looked at Gajira with rage how dare you. The hero lunged at Gajira, who merely glared at him and using his tail grabbed All Might's fist, letting loose a grunt as the force of the blow traveled through him. Impressive. Stronger than last time, it seems rage boosts his power. However, a fight here would be idiotic and counterproductive. Scoffing, Gajira flicked his tail, causing All Might to stumble back. Calm down, he said with a blank face, which did nothing as All Might readied to attack him again. Wait, All Might. A green-haired boy jumped in between them, and with a single sniff Gajira's eyes widened. 
A shard of this boy's scent, it's almost the same as All Might's, ever since he had arrived in this new world. A majority of humanity had a new scent mixed within them. Despite what one may think, a scent was not merely where one had been, it was a mixture, a story of one and who they were, their history, their emotions, their family, and now, even their quirks apparently. Out of all of them, quirks were the only ones that were unique, he had yet to find another whose quirk was the same as another's. Until now, young Midoriya, step aside, All Might said, not harshly but rather in concern. Midoriya shook his head, no, All Might you've got it all wrong. Kajira helped us. He saved us from a monster and the villains. All Might's eyes widened and he looked at the others. Is this true? And when he received nods from all of them, he sighed in relief before looking at Kajira. Thank you for helping them. But still, he pointed a finger at them. Your past actions do not make you innocent. Come quietly or I will use force. Kajira sighed. It seemed All Might was idiotic. Holding up the new goals folder he said to a surprised All Might. Take me to your leader. He proclaimed blandly earning a gasp of surprise from All Might, who no doubt realized what this meant. This is going to be good. Two hours later, Kajira rubbed his eyes in bewilderment. What the fuck are you? He muttered as he stared at the creature in front of him, tiny, rodent-like and completely alien to him, yet undoubtedly from this world. The rodent laughed, who knows? Kajira was sitting in the staff room alone with an All Might who, foolishly, believed that a change of clothes, appearance, and muscle density could fool him. Although it had been a nasty surprise to see his true form, as well as the rodent, who was apparently the principal of UA. As I understand it, you wish to attend UA to undergo hero training, as per the new goals program. The rodent asked, and Gajira nodded in response. Yes, All Might coughed in the awkward silence that followed his one-worded answer. Okay, why UA specifically? The rodent asked, and he shrugged, recommendation from a friend. The rodent nodded, and who is this friend? Godzilla both of the mortals blinked at that. And the rodent gave a hub before pressing a button, you pass my test. But now you need to pass the others Gajira frowned, test. But no sooner than he spoke, did a group of other heroes enter the room, five in total. Who are these? He asked gruffly, his hard voice making two of the heroes pause, while the rest looked at him in surprise. What is he doing here? The tallest one asked, his eyes narrowed. Gajira has undergone the new goals course and seeks to attend UA for the hero course. He's already passed the personality test. Now he just needs to pass willpower and power. Silence rang through the room, and Gajira huffed, willpower and power. Please, I excel at them. The pro heroes looked to one another in uncertainty. Gajira isn't evil, he just had negative encounters with us. So his actions are completely justified, mostly. The cloaked one scoffed, mostly. He tried to kill Mirko Gajira hummed, so she survived. Surprising. Clearly this wasn't the right thing to say, as the pro heroes glared at him in response. Those who attack me don't deserve mercy. I wouldn't kill her now, but I don't promise a lack of villain casualties, Gajira said, attempting to calm the heroes down, which it somewhat did. As principal, I say that he is allowed to attend UA if he passes the other two tests, so who's going to conduct them? The pro heroes looked at one another, before nodding, Midnight will do willpower, and Eraserhead will decide power Gajira frowned and looked at the heroes, and those are. The rodent chuckled, well, Eraserhead is currently in the infirmary, but Midnight. He trailed off as the female hero stepped forward, her outfit far tighter and thinner than any other he had seen, it was almost see-through. Although he would admit, she was certainly attractive. What? No stop that. He shook his head as he looked at Midnight, keeping his eyes on hers and definitely not on her curvaceous body, nope definitely not. Gajira. Shaking his head Gajira snapped back to reality and quickly turned to face the rodent. What? This made said rodent chuckle, are you ready to undergo the tests? Kajira nodded, yes. Midnight clapped and smiled darkly, perfect. Come with me then. Four hours later, you can come in now. Midnight called from the bathroom. Kajira sighed in annoyance. Is this even a test of willpower? All I've done so far is undress Midnight and be told to sleep at her house. She's been ordering me around for four fucking hours. Maybe that's the test of willpower. To see how long it takes me to break. How many thing am I willing to do? It had been a while since Kajira had been challenged this way. Not in combat, but in a competition. The last time he remembered one like this was when the monkey had challenged him to see who could exterminate more of the skulls by night. Obviously, he had won. If they thought he would lose in a competition like this, they were wrong. Opening the door, Kajira entered the bathroom where Midnight lay in the bath calmly, the steam of the water covering her body. Midnight looked at him and a smile grew on her face, about time. Take off your clothes. Kajira frowned, feeling strange about undressing in front of her. Come on, we don't have all day. Midnight ordered, and shaking his head, Gajira did just that, taking off each piece of clothing one after another, until he stood clothless in front of her. Midnight's eyes widened and her face turned red as her eyes strayed on his waist. She must have never seen a penis before. Whoa. Midnight then began to drool as her eyes stayed on his waist. And he frowned, what is it? 
he demanded gruffly, causing Midnight to shake her head. Nothing. Just get in here. Kajira raised an eyebrow but obliged and lowered himself into the bath opposite Midnight. The bath itself was square in shape and big enough for two more people to sit in comfortably. As the warm water went around him, he merely sighed as he stared at Midnight expectantly. What? Midnight asked, causing him to roll his eyes. What now? He asked, and Midnight smirked before shuffling over next to him, rubbing his shoulder with hers. Well, now, we have a good time. She whispered into his ear, making him shiver slightly. Humans are too strange, especially females. Fijira flinched as he felt Midnight's hand rest on his manhood, and immediately he stood up and out of the bath. What? Why are you getting out? Midnight asked in surprise and disappointment. Gajira turned to look at her, because I wanted to. Midnight huffed, I never said you could get out. Gajira shrugged and picked up his clothes. Never said I couldn't either. And before she could protest, exited the room. Note to self, this Midnight is dangerously manipulative. Fifteen minutes later, Gajira's right eye flinched as Midnight entered the room, wearing rather revealing clothes. What is it? He demanded, and Midnight had the gall to look hurt. I need a cuddle buddy to sleep with. So you're going to sleep with me tonight? Gajira sighed. Fine. Standing up, he followed Midnight into her room and lay down on her bed. No funny business, he said. But Midnight instead crawled up onto him and lay down on his stomach after aligning her waist with his so they rubbed together. How peculiar. Must be a human sleeping habit. So with a sigh, he closed his eyes and fell into the darkness of slumber, ignoring the pouting of Midnight as he did. The next day, as Gajira opened his eyes, he noticed something rather concerning. He wasn't hard blinking in confusion. He lifted the blankets to see that not only were his pants pulled down, but his manhood was soft and strangely wet, with a couple of white stains on the sheets around it, along with the fact that Midnight was nowhere to be seen. What happened? Is this a result of the sleeping position from last night? His mind was definitely clearer than usual this morning, and he felt none of the strange human's urges that he usually did in the mornings. So with a shrug, he pulled his pants up and got out of Midnight's bed, before leaving the room in search of the pro hero. Eventually, he found her in the kitchen, humming happily as she almost bounced around for some reason as she searched the drawers for something. She was in the same attire from last night, meaning that she hadn't been awake for long. I awake, he said, causing her to jump. Oh, Kajira, Midnight said in panic as she shoved a small plastic square back into the drawer that she'd brought it from. She quickly tossed her hair back and looked at him, red-faced. He frowned. You have a white liquid on your face, he said, and Midnight panicked. Even more, rushing around and finding a cloth to wipe it off with. Curious that liquid bears a strange scent. Hey, it doesn't matter anyway. Have I passed my test? Kadra asked, and Midnight blinked. Uh, no not yet. Kajira raised an eyebrow, before pointing at the drawer that she had shoved the plastic into. Then I assume that is mine. Midnight panicked even more. Uh, actually you know what? You pass. Congratulations you can go back to UA now. Kajira frowned but shrugged and left the house. Although he did wonder what the plastic cube was, as well as the white liquid and pretty much everything else that had happened that morning. I'll ask the rodent when I have the chance. Fifty minutes later, Kajira paused before he opened the staff room door. Three scents came from within, two familiars, the other alien, the rodent, and the rabbit, and a barbecue. Rolling his eyes and mentally preparing for the shouting that was about to erupt, he entered the room to see rodent, rabbit, and a flaming human chatting. The rabbit heard his entrance and turned to look at him. Her eyes instantly widened and she pointed at him. You. What the fuck are you doing here? The flaming man looked at him in confusion which quickly turned into hostility. Is this the one that put Mirko in the infirmary? Why is a criminal here? Nezu. Ah, so that's the rodent's name. Nezu. Nezu chuckled. No need for hostility. Kajira has undergone the new goals program and is looking to attend UA. Aizawa has already passed Kajira in the third test. But on the condition that he gets your blessings to attend. The rabbit scoffed. Attend you are you insane? Fine, but you're digging your own grave Nezu. The flaming hero hummed. You'll be a good challenge for Shoto. You have my blessing as well. Nezu clapped. Well then. Kajira welcome to your hero academia. Kajira. I thought you said I was in. Kajira grumbled as he stood outside the classroom which contained the children he had saved from the abomination called Namo. Nezu nodded. Well, yes. But the blessing of two heroes alone isn't enough to pass this major test of strength. You need to be appraised, watched. Kajira frowned, appraised. I'm not an oar. Nezu chuckled well, yes, what I meant is that your stats, power, speed, etc. need to be measured. That's why you're here. Kajira raised an eyebrow, before pointing at the two heroes that had followed him, Mirko and Endeavor, them. Mirko growled, we're here to make sure you don't cause any problems, cause if you do become one, we get to beat you up. Kajira scoffed, go ahead and try mammal. He turned around and tried to push the door. When it didn't move he tried to pull it, and again it didn't move. What the? Is this even a door? Uh, Kajira, it slides, Nezu muttered, and Kajira blinked, before moving the door to the left, which it easily did. 
Hearing snickers from behind him he shot a glare at the rabbit, which only made her laugh visibly. Wisely, Endeavor wasn't visibly amused, although he could tell that the hero found it entertaining. She's going to suffer for that. Huffing, Gajira entered the room, which was currently alight with chatter and voices, which were all silenced once he entered. With a stern gaze, Gajira could see the green-haired kid standing there, a complete nervous wreck. Hum, where is that bravery that I witnessed before? This human is a bag of worries. If he wants to protect the world he needs to learn courage. He mentally chuckled, remembering the flaming one and the rival. If they ever met, he was certain that they would straighten this child out. Alas, he doubted it would happen. The blue-haired kid with glasses stood up almost instantly, straight as a wall and holding a hand to his head in a sign of respect. Principal Nezu, Mirko and Endeavor, may I ask why Gajira is here at this moment? Gajira nearly rolled his eyes. This kid spoke irritatingly formally, like a human soldier. I'm so glad you asked. As you all know, Gajira has undergone the new goals course and Nezu stopped as a child with pink skin. Raised her hand, yes Mina. Nezu asked, what's the new goals course? Because I've been hearing a lot about it. But I've got no clue as to what it actually is. Nezu nodded. Understandable Mina. Does anyone here know what the new goals course is? This time a curvaceous girl with black hair raised her hand. And after receiving a nod from Nezu, explained. The new goals course is a program originally created by the number one of Australia, Serpent Dokara. Its focus is to rehabilitate villains, criminals or fugitives, and turn their focus and powers into helping civilians, usually by becoming heroes. Since its establishment 30 years ago, more than 100 pro-heroes have been made with its help. There are three stages to the course each with multiple subcategories. First is the probation category, where the subject is tutored and observed by a pro-hero who has the ability to defeat them if need be until the pro-hero is satisfied with the subject's development. Then is the testing category where the subject joins a hero school in one of its courses such as the hero or support courses. They first undergo three tests to measure their personality, willpower, and overall combat ability, which provides the government with their stats. If the subject passes these tests and is accepted into the school of their choice, they then take a position of the principal's choosing while undergoing a unique schedule best suited for their needs. After that is the exam category where they attain their provisional hero's license and finally graduate from the hero school as a fully-fledged pro-hero. Sprouted a fucking parable there. This human talks too much. Excellent work Yeyurazu, Nezu said, giving a small clap, while Gajira nearly yawned. Gajira has already passed the probation category under Godzilla, as well as both the personality and willpower tests, and is now undergoing the overall combat ability test. I decided that since all of you are familiar with Gajira's abilities, it would be best for you to witness this test. Aizawa is the test ready. A gasp came from the children and Gajira was surprised himself as he turned around to see a human covered in bandages standing in front of them. Can he even see? Yes, it's ready Nezu. Aizawa then turned his gaze to Gajira. Let's find out just how powerful you really are. Ten minutes later, you will be completing nine tests for us to gauge your abilities. First will be the 50 meter dash. Next will be grip strength, followed by standing long jump, repeated side steps, ball throw, distance run, seated toe touch, and finally sit-ups. Kajira raised an eyebrow as Aizawa spoke. Each of those are pointless in combat. It would be more efficient for me to battle your students. At his words, the children all stiffened and looked at Aizawa with fear, to which the man simply sighed. Your combat skills have already been proven by multiple people. That isn't the reason for this test, which is to measure your power as I've already told you. Kajira sighed. This is pointless. Fine, I'll do it. The tests. 50 meter dash. Kajira merely stood as Aizawa counted down for the test to begin. Start, he shouted, and almost immediately Kajira slammed his tail into the ground creating a shockwave as he rocketed towards and over the finish line. 3.05 seconds. Grip strength. With a huff, Kajira looked at the device in his hand. Without another word he proceeded to crush it completely before dropping it onto the ground, shocking everyone. How do we measure that? The purple child asked, to which Aizawa responded. He would need more than five kilograms of force to crush it the way he did, to which every child gasped in shock. Five thousand. Standing long jump. Kajira didn't even wait this time, and again slammed his tail into the ground clearing the sandpit easily. Repeated side steps. Begin. Aizawa shouted, and Kajira's face gained a much more serious appearance. Crouching down he became a blur as he hopped from side to side. The ground below him mercilessly demolished as a result. Ball throw. You want me to throw it? Kajira asked as he looked at the soft bowl in mild confusion. Aizawa nodded and pointed. That way, as hard as you can, you can use your quirk if it helps. Kajira nodded in response, turned around, and with a wordless yell tossed the ball into the stratosphere. 49,889.7 meters, Aizawa said, absolutely stunning everyone in the process. He would have been number one if it wasn't for you, Yuraraka. 
Green hair shouted, and Gajira looked at the somewhat chubby girl in confusion. She got infinity using her quirk, zero gravity what? Distance run. So I run until I get tired? Gajira asked and Aizawa nodded. With a shrug, Gajira turned around and began to run around the course for the next three hours before Aizawa finally called him back. Seated toe touch. Gajira growled in anger standing up and kicking the measuring device away. This is useless. And stormed away. Gajira only got halfway down his ankles. Sit-ups. Aizawa merely sighed and waved his hand. Don't worry about this one. You'll just keep doing them for days. Gajira nodded. You're learning. Good. After the tests. So, what is my score? Gajira asked impatiently as the three heroes discussed his results. Finally. Once they all concluded the result they looked at him and said, First place. Gajira nodded in satisfaction. Good. Now, usually this would be the end of the test. But since you seemed so eager to fight someone, I think I'll grant you your wish. You can spar some of class 1 it. Aizawa said, and Gajira raised an eyebrow at that. You want me to fight children? Are you sure that's wise? Aizawa shrugged. We've got recovery girl. As long as you don't kill, maim or torture we can fix it. Although it will just be a spar mind you. Gajira chuckled. Fine then. I'll heed your wishes. He then turned to the children, now identified as Class 1A who were staring at him with mixed emotions. Most of them looked at him with fear, although there was excitement and hostility mixed within several students as well. Who am I fighting? Kajira asked looking down at the students. Aizawa pointed to them as he spoke. Todoroki, Bakugu, Kirishima, and Midoriya, get over here. Everyone else out of the way. Ah, uh, so I'm fighting green hair. This could prove interesting. Cracking his knuckles, Gajira grinned as the four students in question got ready in front of him, each of them dressed in gym clothes. Aizawa was planning this. He wants to see if I can stay in control. Gajira realized, but it didn't matter. These children would be put in their places. Begin, Aizawa said, and almost instantly the blonde, Bakugu, exploded at him. Literally, explosions erupted from his hands and he rocketed towards Gajira. Die, Bakugu shouted, making the kaijin frown, easily sidestepping the boy. He moved to slam him into the ground, when a sharp cold enveloped him, and his head shot towards his feet, seeing ice creeping up his legs, turning to see the culprit. He narrowed his eyes when he saw Todoroki looking at him indefinitely, almost in boredom, and as the ice closed around him, he heard the boy's last words. If my father thinks you'll challenge me he's wrong. Fuck this, and fuck Aizawa. This kid's going in a body bag. With a shout, Kajira released a weak atomic pulse that instantly destroyed the ice, and glared at Todoroki. Those were your last words mortal. Die, bastard. Kajira didn't even look at Bakugu as he slapped the boy in the face with his tail, sending him flying into Kirishima. Then he lunged at Todoroki and smashed through the ice walls that he created as he did. Pathetic. He yelled as he grabbed Todoroki by the neck and slammed him into the ground, knocking the wind out of the bug instantly. Then he put his foot on the boy's head, yield. He growled putting a small amount of pressure on the child's head when smash. Kajira's head shot up as he felt a strong wind slam into his side, making him stumble slightly. Turning his head his eyes widened with surprise when he saw the culprit was green hair. Did he yell smash? Like oh might. Could he? Wait, his fingers, they're broken. Kajira frowned in confusion as he looked at Midoriya. Then walking to him, he knocked Todoroki unconscious as he passed the boy. Smash, smash, smash. Midoriya screamed, again and again, flicking his fingers to create the powerful gusts of wind, and breaking them each time. Yet each time the wind crashed into him, he merely grunted and continued walking, until he stood in front of the boy and grabbed his arm. Cease this Midoriya, Kajira said gruffly, giving the boy a stare that froze him instantly. Don't ignore me you extra. Bakugu screamed as he rocketed towards Kajira, but with a sigh, Kajira grabbed the boy by the head and let him strike him with the explosions from his hands. Is that all? Kajira asked as Bakugu looked at him in shock. Pathetic, he said, before tossing the boy away, then glaring at Kirishima, which turned the red boy pale. He scoffed, and dragging Midoriya by the arm he walked up to Aizawa. Care to tell me why this boy breaks his fingers with his quirk? He asked, to which Aizawa looked at Midoriya in slight disappointment. He can't control his quirk, so he breaks his bones whenever he uses it. Kajira looked back at Midoriya, then back to Aizawa, take him to the healer. In the meantime, I wish to see what the rest of your class is capable. Nezu, three hours later, he beat up my entire class, Nezu, at once, he's dangerous, Aizawa said, to which Nezu simply chuckled, certainly, to our enemies, Aizawa groaned, he's dangerous to everyone, Mina's acid had no effect, he shrugged off Bekuga's explosions like they were a light breeze, Denki's lightning only made him angry, and dark shadows fucking petrified of him, a quirk is afraid of this guy, you can't tell me he's normal, Nezu's face suddenly turned dark, I never said he was normal, quite the opposite in fact. Aizawa frowned, and at that moment All Might, Endeavor, and Hawks entered the room, each of them sitting down in their seats. Thank you for coming, Endeavor, Hawks. What I tell you must never be revealed to anyone that you don't trust with your life. 
understand. The heroes all nodded, and Nezu continued pressing a button as a hologram of an abandoned lab deep in the forest appeared. When Gajira first appeared, I thought it was strange that such a powerful quirk user had appeared from nowhere. So I asked Hawks to investigate, pressing another button. The image changed to the inside of the abandoned lab, inside it was several pieces of discarded technology, but also a single test tube that had been broken from within. We found this, an abandoned lab with almost no technology present, save for one test tube. And inside that test tube we found this. Nezu tossed a black scale onto the table, Aizawa, All Might, and Endeavor's eyes all widened as they recognized it. Is that? Aizawa asked. Nezu nodded, a scale, identical to Gajira's. He was inside that test tube. He isn't natural. Aizawa narrowed his eyes. What do you want us to do about him? Endeavor asked. But it wasn't Nezu who answered. Listen to my tale. All four heroes jumped up as Gajira walked out of the shadows. His eyes narrowed at them. It was Gajira that confirmed my suspicions. He admitted to his involvement in the lab freely, and he told me of his past. I need you to listen to it, and keep an open mind. The pro heroes looked at one another. How can we be sure he won't lie? Aizawa asked, and Nezu shrugged. A truth finder quirk assisted us the first time, so I know the truth as well. Gajira sighed. Must they know? Nezu nodded. It's for the best so again. Gajira sighed before speaking. Where I'm from, there's no such thing as a quirk. Aizawa stood up. Impossible. You have a quirk. Gajira glared at Aizawa with such malice that the pro hero gulped and sat back down. I'm not from this world. And where I'm from, there's no such thing as quirks or heroes. There are only the titans, kaiju, the rulers of the world, and I ruled them. The humans called me many names, Godzilla among them. But I only thought of myself as one thing, nature's wrath. As the king of the kaiju, I protected the natural order from those who sought it harm. I defeated any that dared to challenge me as the alpha titan and destroyed any who sought to destroy nature. The Titans, we generate unique energy and radiation that regenerates nature itself, repairs it, and fixes it. We exist as the balance. Many have sought to destroy it, and I but they all fail and fell. I have killed thousands in my role and have lived for millions. I know not how I got here, but I do know that I must return to my home to protect my fellow Titans, if nothing else, and I am becoming a hero, both to protect nature and find a way to return to both my true form and home. The pro heroes all stared at Kajira then at Nezu, and back at Kajira. Is this the truth? Aizawa asked, and Nezu nodded, causing the pro heroes to lose their nuts. Kajira, that afternoon, Kajira sighed as he stretched out on the bed. Thankfully, he was now allowed to sleep in his own room, and he was quickly becoming grateful for the privacy, since it meant he could actually think for once. That Midoriya boy, to wield such strength in his fingertips, he must have formidable strength, perhaps even kaiju level. Each of these quirks is powerful, invisibility, zero gravity, super strength, and super speed. It's truly intriguing. Gajira caught himself on his last thoughts and chuckled. The winged one would never believe it if she saw me now, thinking and analyzing mortal powers. But, there's something I just can't shake. Midoriya. He sat up, and with a single sniff of the air, detected the boy still resting inside the infirmary, deciding to indulge his curiosity. He stood up and traveled over to Midoriya, entering the room without any greeting. Midoriya Gajira said, causing the boy to jump in surprise. G Gajira, what are you doing here? Midoriya asked, causing Gajira to sigh. Calm down mortal, I wish to discuss your quirk. Midoriya froze instantly. Interesting. What, do you want to know about it? Midoriya asked nervously. Gajira sat down on a chair next to Midoriya and looked at him. The basics, tell me what it is and how it works. Midoriya nodded. Well, my quirk's called superpower and it lets me increase my physical strength to extreme level. Kajira held up a hand, and Midoriya trailed off. You want to lie to me? Fine. Midoriya flinched. But I wasn't. I don't care if your quirk's from fucking cannibalism. I do care about you controlling it. Midoriya blinked. Controlling it? Kajira nodded in response. You have immense strength, boy. But not only can you not handle it, but you lack the skill to use it. Midoriya clearly didn't follow. And Kajira raised his right arm and channeled some atomic energy into it, causing it to erupt into blue flames. My quirk isn't my mutation. It's this, atomic and nuclear production and manipulation, with something else which makes me a walking nuclear apocalypse. Midoriya froze, but this time not in fear, because he quickly brought out a book and began mumbling as he wrote something down. Kajira waited for Midoriya to stop before continuing. My quirk is dangerous as well Midoriya. If I use too much even I am injured by its ferocity, and if I don't control it, I will kill anyone around me. So I learned to control it in my limbs, organs, and even in bursts. Midoriya looked at him, confusion slowly growing on his face. Why are you telling me this? I'm nothing special. Kajira shook his head. I know an alpha when I see one. And you, Midoriya, have the potential to become an alpha yourself, but not without training. He stood up suddenly, surprising Midoriya. Meet me here tomorrow at first light. 
and we will begin your training. Then without another word he left the room and was met by Aizawa and Nezu. Didn't have the courage to enter. Kajira taunted crossing his arms. Nezu instead chuckled happily, not really no, but we wanted to listen. And I'm glad we did, because I know what your role here is going to be. Kajira raised an eyebrow. What? You're going to be a mentor, teacher, and guardian for one. A Gajira blinked in unison with Aizawa. What? Aizawa shouted, while Gajira merely groaned in annoyance. Great, now I have to train side characters. The next day, Gajira stood in the middle of the training arena with crossed arms, tapping his right foot on the ground impatiently as he did. How long is it going to take? He muttered, right before Midoriya rushed into the arena, wearing what he guessed was his hero suit. I'm sorry I'm late Gajira. Midoriya said in a panic, bowing to him. Gajira huffed. Being late means death in the real world Midoriya, for yourself or for others. Don't make that mistake again. Midoriya nodded, and Gajira walked around him, inspecting his outfit. So this is your hero suit. Tell me Midoriya, when you use your quirk, how do you use it? Midoriya instantly opened his mouth, but Gajira stopped him, think about it. You channel your quirk into your limbs, sacrificing them for the usage of your full power. That's idiotic, amateuristic even, and it'll get you killed. Midoriya's shoulders slumped, and Gajira whacked him in the back of the head. Hold your head high boy. Weakness has no place in combat. Midoriya nodded and straightened himself. Gajira nodded before continuing. Rather than use your quirk at 100%, in singular limbs, use it at lesser percentages, all throughout your body. Midoriya's eyes widened. You mean, use less but channel more. Kajira rolled his eyes. Sure, whatever. Just fucking do it. Midoriya yelped and closed his eyes. Visualize your power, picture it. Use too much and you will break. Use too little and you may as well not use it at all. Find your limit, like an egg in a microwave. Kajira frowned. What? Fine, it doesn't matter what you visualize it as. Just do. Channel your quirk throughout your entire body and lower it until you find your limit. Midoriya nodded and almost immediately, red veins appeared throughout Midoriya's body fading quickly to reveal green lightning arcing around him. At first, it was intense and powerful, but quickly it fell and fell until it was merely a flicker. Kajira nodded, well done. You're a fast user. You are now circulating the quirk throughout your entire body at once, rather than in single limbs for short bursts. How much can you use? Kajira asked. Midoriya opened his eyes, 5%, and Kajira sweat dropped. That's pathetic boy. Kajira, three days later, Kajira could only grumble as he stood at the back of the room. I should be out there, hunting the insects that dared to defy death. And yet, here I am, babysitting these hatchlings. If the rodent wasn't my only hope at returning to my true form. Kajira's thoughts trailed off into fantasies of all the ways he would have broken out of the school and tortured the insects who defied nature, mainly revolving around atomic burns and nuclear illness. You guys. Kajira flinched as the all-too-happy voice of the invisible girl spoke up. Did you watch the news last night? The tailed one nodded, yeah, the sleeve of the invisible girl raised, signifying that she raised her arm. It was so cool that we got a few seconds of screen time. The invisible girl's shoulders then sagged, and her voice took a more somber tone though I bet nobody noticed me hanging out in the background with everyone focusing on Kajira. The multi-armed one winced, probably not. It is difficult to stand out when you're just a pair of gloves. The tailed one raised a finger ad on the fact that Kajira is a natural show stealer and I don't think any of us stood much chance. Such concern about popularity. This is mediocre at best compared to what I used to get. The blonde one leaned back on his chair. Those news channels love us. We're basically celebrities the red-haired one nodded. Yeah, it's crazy right. I mean, we didn't even really do anything the strange-eared girl sighed. Get over yourselves. The hero course that pumps out pros were attacked and a former villain saved us and that's what they care about. Gajira sighed quietly. I knew the human younglings talked often, but this is irritating. Unlike the rest of the room's occupants, Gajira himself wasn't concerned about the attack, but rather the attackers. The Namu in particular, it was artificially created by insects, and in insect fashion, I doubt they would have left such a powerful weapon well enough alone. These younglings are missing the point. Deciding to add his two cents, Gajira spoke up. You are all missing the point. Almost instantly the younglings silenced and turned to look at him. Uh, what point? The pink one asked. Kajira scoffed. The Nama wasn't natural, any fool with eyes could see that. The girl with the ponytail's eyes widened, as she began to understand. That means it was artificially created. Kajira nodded, indeed. Do you know what that means? This time it was Midoriya who spoke up. That means there could be more like it. Kajira uncrossed his arms, not could Midoriya. Will, you, humans, are destructive and possessive by nature. You find a weapon, and you abuse it. Mark my words, there will be more Namu, they will be stronger, faster, better. As you all are, you stand no chance against them, and when you meet another Namu unless you become stronger, you will perish. Silence fell over the room, and Gajira scoffed at the wide eyes that all stared at him. People aren't like that. 
Sure some of us are the redhead protested standing up. But Kajira leveled a glare at him, silencing him. You discovered how to make fire. And now you have bombs and flamethrowers. You discovered farming. And now you destroy nature for money and personal gain. You discover radiation. And you create the nuclear bomb. And now, there is the Namo. Quirks are just the latest in the eternal line of exploitation. The redhead opened his mouth to speak. But no words came out. And Gajira rolled his eyes. Attention. Gajira groaned as he heard the voice of the jetted one running into the room. Homeroom class is about to begin. Everyone stop talking and return to your seats. Gajira's face palmed at the insect's antics. Ah, uh, we're all sitting. The red-haired one said. And the elbow one agreed. Yeah, you're the only one standing. The jetted insect was sitting down before elbow even finished his sentence. Dang it, he muttered. The chubbyish one tried to console the jetted one. Don't sweat it. The pink one leaned back in her seat to talk to the frog behind her. Hey, Tsu. So who do you think is going to be teaching class today? The frog tilted her head. No idea. Mr. Aizawa is still in hospital recovering from his injuries. Recognizing an approaching scent, Gajira nearly chuckled. That human is certainly resilient. The door opened and Gajira felt a small flare of respect ignite for Aizawa as he walked into the room. Morning, class. Mr. Aizawa. What are you doing here? The younglings all shouted in shock. The blonde stared at Aizawa in a mix of fear and awe. Whoa, what a pro. Gajira blinked in small surprise as he saw the bandages that covered Aizawa. Can he even see? The jetted one raised a hand, Mr. Aizawa. I'm glad you're okay. The chubbyish one didn't seem to agree with the jetted one. You call that okay? My well-being is irrelevant. Aizawa grumbled as he arrived at the desk. What's more important is that your fight isn't over yet. Our fight? Asked the second blonde one, don't tell me. Midoriya muttered. Not more bad guys. The small insect shouted in fear. The UA Sports Festival is about to start the red head shouted in excitement. While the others shouted, why would you scare us like that? Sports Festival? The rodent mentioned something along the lines of that. Let's go kick some ass. The red-haired one shouted. Wait, a second. Is it really such a good idea to hold the sports festival so soon after the villains snuck inside? The weird-eared one asked. They could attack once we're all in the same place. The tailed one said. Apparently, the administration thinks this is a good way to show that the threat has been handled and our school is safer than ever. Plus they've been beefing up security compared to past years. And that's without Gajira's presence. This is a huge opportunity for all students at UA. It's not something we can cancel because of a few villains. Aizawa explained. Oh, I'm sorry, but why not? It's just a sports festival? The small insect asked. Gajira would take it to the grave. But he shared the small insect's views here sadly. Midoriya turned around to face the small insect. Huh, Minta, don't you know how important this competition is? The small insect nodded. Of course I do. I just don't want to get murdered. Our sports festival is one of the most watched events in the entire world. In the past everyone obsessed over the Olympic Games. Kajira huffed quietly at Aizawa's words, muttering, they were entertaining, I always watched those. He didn't fail to notice the weird-eared girl flinch and glance back at him with a confused look. Hum, super hearing. Noted. But then quirks started appearing. Now the Olympics have been drastically reduced in terms of scale and viewership. For anyone who cares about competition, there's only one tournament that matters. The UA Sports Festival. Kajira descended into continuous muttering. Unhappy that one of his old favorite shows was overcome by a child's competition. That's right. And top heroes everywhere will be watching. This is where you get scouted. The ponytailed one said, sure, unless you're dead. The small insect said, she's right. After graduating, a lot of people join pro agencies as a psychic. Yeah, but that's as far as some go. They miss their chances to go indie and stay eternal psychics. Actually, that's probably where you're headed. You're kinda dumb the weird-eared one said to the blonde one. Kajira didn't even comment, instead focusing on the fall of the Olympics. Humanity decides that watching children use their quirks to cheat is more entertaining than watching the fruits of hard labor and dedication. It was Aizawa's voice that finally brought Kajira out of his rumbling. It's true that joining a famous hero agency can garner you greater experience and popularity. That's why the festival matters. If you want to go pro one day, then this event could open a path for you. One chance a year. Three chances in a lifetime. No aspiring hero can afford to miss this festival. That means you better not slack off on your training the class all nodded. But before Aizawa dismissed them Midoriya raised his hand. What is it Midoriya? Aizawa asked. It's about the festival. Aizawa sighed. What about it? I know that. For all of us, it's a chance to test our skills and grow against others. But what about Kajira? Midoriya asked. The small insect yelped as a haze of despair and fear surrounded him. Oh shit, I totally forgot about him. If he's in the festival, we don't stand a chance. The blonde one joined in, also sharing the fear forget that, we won't survive he'll kill us all. Kajira scoffed. 
They know their place. This festival may prove useful after all, in showing these insects how weak. That's simple, he won't be participating, Aizawa revealed, cutting off Kajira's thoughts and the ramblings of the younglings. What? Kajira asked, confused and annoyed. Aizawa shrugged. After seeing your performance with Namu, it was obvious that the festival would be little but a game for you. And in doing so, you would steal all of the opportunities from the other students. So we decided that you won't participate in it. Many of the insects sighed in relief at that. And Gajira deadpanned. Class is dismissed. That rodent's always ruining my fun. Later that day, that villain stuff sucked for sure. But I'm pumped for these games. The red-haired one shouted. We put on a good show. And we're basically on the road to Bane Pros. Exclaimed the weird elbowed one. Yeah, this is why I'm even here in the first place. The fat-lipped one said, we get so few chances, we have to make the most of this. The bird one muttered, oh, Manajiro, I'm getting kind of nervous about the festival. I have to come up with a way to be noticed. The invisible girl said, uh, sure. The tailed one agreed in slight confusion, maybe with a cheer. Maybe you should be looking at a shinier costume or something. Otherwise, you're gonna have to try really hard. The tailed one said, my, what's a boy to do? I stand out even when I'm standing still. That means the scouts won't be able to take their eyes off me. The third blonde one said, pointing at the rock-headed one, don't you agree? The rock-headed one then nodded repeatedly. You're so lucky Shoji. People are bound to notice your unique quirk the blonde one sighed. Sure but what matters is that I show them how useful I can be the multi-armed one said. No doubt you'll make a scene. To the weird-eared one snickered, making the blonde one growl. Gajira shook his head, before turning to Midoriya. And walking over to him and his group. This is gonna be nuts. Everyone's so excited. Midoriya said happily. Well, yeah. Of course, we are. We enrolled at this school with the sole aim to become heroes. So naturally, we're getting all fired up. The jetted one exclaimed. Wow Ida, those are some interesting moves Ribbit the Frog observed. You have to be excited too, right, Midoriya? The jetted one said, making small hand chops as he did. Well, yeah of course I am. And also nervous, Midoriya said. Although there was a hint of confidence in his usually weak voice. Likely a result of his training. Deku, Ida, Gajira, Midoriya and the jetted one all looked at the chubbyish one, and Gajira was surprised at the look of absolute determination and bloodlust on her face. What the hell is wrong with her? Let's do our best in the sports festival. She said, you're Raka, what happened to your face? Midoriya asked in surprise and slight fear. You're normally, like, the most laid-back girl ever. The pink one observed, PMS. The small insect asked, only to be promptly slapped by the frog's tongue. The chubbyish one raised a hand into the air as shadows covered the top of her face, giving her a demonic appearance everyone. I'm gonna do my best, she shouted. Midoriya and the jetted ones raised their hands in agreement, although with much less energy. With Pinky joining in, yeah. The chubbyish one then turned to the red-haired one, the bird one, and the elbow one. I said, I'm gonna do my best. They also raised their arms, you okay? You kinda look like you're lost in it, the red-haired one said. Kajira nearly flinched as the chubbyish one then turned to her. I said, I'm gonna do my best. She screamed. Although she and everyone else noticed who she had shouted at, they all went quiet and the chubbish one's face turned to worry. But Kajira chuckled. You have a fire within you. Good. Yuraka blinked, before smiling thanks. Her face then returned to bloodlust and she went off to find new victims. After the end of school, Kajira hummed in satisfaction as the final class ended, and he could finally return to training and extend an offer to Yuraka. Yuraka has devotion and a strong competitive spirit. But her strength betrays her. Perhaps she would do well in training as well. But as he stood up and walked towards the exit, where the jetted one, Midoriya and Yuraka all currently stood, he paused before frowning and muttering, What the hell? Blocking the exit of the room was a mob of younglings. You um, why the heck are you all here? Yuraka shouted, Do you students have some sort of business with our class? The jetted one asked, Why are you blocking our doorway? I won't let you hold us hostage. The small insect shouted, They're scouting out the competition. Idiots, the second blonde one said as he walked past them. We're the class that survived a real villain attack. They just want to see us with their own eyes. He continued, while Midoriya was assuring the small insect that the second blonde wouldn't explode anyone. At least now you know what a future pro looks like. Now move it extras the second blonde growled. Instantly the jetted one shouted, You can't walk around calling people extras just because you don't know who they are. The second blonde isn't wrong though. But as Gajira watched the scene with amusement, a new voice spoke up. So this is class 1A. I heard you guys were impressive, but you just sound like an ass. As Gajira watched, a lanky purple-haired boy pushed himself to the front of the crowd. Almost immediately Gajira disliked him. Is everyone in the hero course delusional, or just you? The others next to Gajira were shocked and began to shake their heads in a warning. How sad to come here and find a bunch of egomaniacs. 
Not to mention you've got a villain for a friend. Kajira narrowed his eyes at the last part. I wanted to be in the hero course, but like many others here, I was forced to choose a different track, such as life. I didn't cut it the first time around, but I have another chance. If any of us do well in the sports festival, the teachers can decide to transfer us to the hero course, and they'll have to transfer people out to make room. The jetted one, Yuraka and Midoriya all gasped at that, scouting the competition. Maybe some of my peers are, but I'm here to let you know that if you don't bring your very best, I'll steal your spot right from under you. Consider this a declaration of war Gajira laughed at that, making the lanky boy move his head back in surprise. A declaration of war. Pitiful, Gajira walked forward, making the insects step back. To the lanky one's credit, he stood still for a little longer than most. Pitiful, I don't think you understand. Even if you're from the new goals course, you aren't safe from being transferred out. If I was you, I would be careful or I'll take one of your friend's places Gajira scoffed. Insect, you should watch your tongue. You had your chance to get into this room, you just like everyone else. And you failed, like so many. He then glared at the boy. That means that everyone in this room is better than you, stronger than you. They are superior. If you take their place, they don't deserve to be here. But until that happens, they do. And I look forward to seeing you be beaten into your place, even if I can't do it myself. The lanky one's eyes widened in freight, and Gajira growled, turning his gaze to the others, now leave, before I start breaking bones. He then turned around to face Yuraka and Midoriya, Midoriya, Yuraka, come with me. The two nodded and ran to his side, and they left, the mob of insects parting like the Red Sea before them. Twenty minutes later, Ooh, Gajira, what are we doing here? Midoriya asked, confused. Kajira had taken them to one of the free battle centers and was standing in front of them with crossed arms. Uh, yeah why am I here Gajira? You've never asked me to train with you before Yuraka asked. Scratching the back of her head, Kajira sighed. I asked you to train here Yuraka because you earned a sliver of respect from me. Yuraka blinked. Respect? How? Kajira pointed at her. Your fighting spirit. Your fierce determination was impressive and unexpected from you. As such you have earned the right to train alongside Midoriya. I will put you through hell, but you will become stronger for it. Are you ready? Yuraka's eyes widened but she nodded. And Gajira smirked as he took on a more feral stance and glared at them good. Now run. Two weeks later, Gajira huffed as he watched the bleachers below. He, alongside numerous other UA staff and pro heroes, was seated in a special booth away from the other insects. He sorely recognized anyone else, but apparently others recognized him. Boy, scaly Gajira looked up and turned his head to see a short. Oddly familiar figure storming up to him, anger written on her face. Dismissing the nickname, Gajira merely looked at her. Last time I was here, I couldn't say what I wanted to. But that ain't the case now. Gajira deadpan do I know you? The woman's eyes widened and she just stared at him in mute shock for a moment. That's when Gajira began to take note of several features. Dark skin, strong build, long white hair, red eyes, and bunny ears. Sighing he said, All right, Miro. An expression of absolute rage covered the woman's face. It's Mirko jackass. Sure whatever. Mirko tapped his chest. I've got a score to settle. And you better be ready for when I do. Gajira rolled his eyes but said nothing. And what are you doing up here anyway? Mirko asked. Gajira looking at her said blankly. I am acting as both security and a referee for the students of UA. I will stop the fights if they get out of hand, and I will stop any intruders from entering during the earlier rounds. Mirko blinked, then what are you doing here? She asked. Gajira nodded at her. Talking to you Mirko growled but before she could answer him, an irritating voice boomed out from the speakers near him. Hey oh, make some noise you rabid sports fans. Gajira sighed. That's my cue to leave. So turning around he left the booth and headed towards the exit to patrol the stadium. Fifteen minutes later, Kajira grumbled as he continued his path around the stadium. This is boring. Almost makes me regret choosing this job. Almost. Izuku Midoriya is our champion. Kajira looked up at the nearby projector and let a small grin grow on his face. Good job Midoriya but as he looked down, he realized there were two pro heroes staring at him in mute surprise. One of them looked like a walking tree, while the other looked like a human compressor. There was a third one to the side, a female, wearing an extremely tight outfit. What? He asked, deadpanning at the other pro heroes. The walking tree pointed at him, you're the guy who thought Godzilla aren't you? The former villain Gajira. Gajira nodded, but before he could respond, he felt a foot plant itself into his cheek and push him back a foot or two. Eyes widening in anger, Gajira spun around to see the female pro hero in a fighting stance, the villain Gajira. This is a golden opportunity for me, she shouted, while the walking tree and compressor's eyes widened and they were waving their arms trying to get the foolish girl's attention. Moronic fool, she will need to be put in her place. With a single glance at the walking tree and compressor, he conveyed his message and they both stopped, agreeing with him, although their eyes were requesting that he didn't break her. He also glanced at the nearby media. She must be extremely foolish for that to be their one request. 
And from what I hear, hero rankings are partially reliant on public recognition. So I guess I'm about to jump up the ladder I haven't even begun to climb. Gajira raised his head. Don't attack me again insect. The pro hero scoffed, calling me an insect. I'm Mount Lady. Gajira deadpan. Nah, you're Mount Shorty. The other two pro heroes chuckled at the insult, while the blonde pro looked outraged. I'll show you. And with that, she began to grow. Gajira slowly raised his head in small surprise as the pro hero grew to large proportions, but insect standard. With my quirk, Gigantify, I'll defeat you, she proclaimed. She calls the Gigantify. She's what, 67 feet tall? Please, my kaiju form is more than 5x that height. The pro raised a foot and went to crush him beneath it. But Kajira merely looked up at it and raised his right hand, grunting from the impact. Kajira nearly stumbled but held firm as he held the pro back with one arm. Weak, was all he said, as he pushed the foot off him, slammed his tail into the ground, and uppercut the pro heroine, making her stumble back towards the stadium. Aw oh shit, she's gonna wreck it. The heroine seemed to have the same thought train, as she quickly returned to her original form. An animalistic grin growing on his face. He leapt up, around 60 feet, and caught her in his arms, much to her surprise. Hey, let me go. She shouted as he landed back on the ground, grunting slightly as he did. Gajara merely chuckled as she continued to hit his chest in a futile attempt to make him release her. After sending a glare at the media to make them scram, he put her over his shoulder and walked over to the other two pro heroes. You, do you have any idea what you just did? The tree asked. The pro heroine cried out in anger and despair from his shoulder. Are you guys in on this too? I don't want to be kidnapped. The compressor sighed. Gajira went through the new goals program you, he's a good guy now. And you just attacked him. Gajira dropped the heroine, who had a very shocked look on her face, onto the ground. Then why'd you let me fight him? She shouted jumping up. The walking tree shrugged. We thought you needed a lesson. And Gajira just so happened to provide the chance. Besides, he fought the number two of America on equal footing. You really thought you would have beaten him. To this, the pro heroine deflated mumbling depression. While Gajira only scoffed, you should learn to recognize your superiors. Godzilla was a much stronger opponent than you. He then turned around to head back into the stadium. One hour later, Gajira chuckled as he watched the pure, unadulterated rage that was coming from Bakugu. I don't want that piece of garbage. All Might reached out to place the metal on Bakugu's head. Come on now get that trash off of me, you idiot. However, Bakugu's struggle was useless as the metal then decided to rest in his jaw, standing on the podium. Was the three that Class 1 had taken to calling the monster trio Bakugu was in first, with Todoroki in second, and finally Midoriya in third. Sadly, even with his training, Yuraka had been unable to defeat Bakugu but had definitely managed to damage him. However, his attention was more locked on Todoroki than Bakugu. They had managed to impress him with their displays, and the pushing of their limits. But more than that was the truth of Todoroki's quirk. Fire with his left. And ice with his right, a powerful quirk, especially considering he only used his fire in the battle with Midoriya. Even still Midoriya had nearly come out on top. Full cowling had proven to be a boon for Midoriya. Um, continued training with full cowling and overall body strengthening for Midoriya. Nausea training for Yuraka. And perhaps attitude adjustment for Todoroki if I was to train him. Gajira shook his head, since when was he becoming a mother Saurus for these younglings? Although, a flash of JR and Minola was all it took for him to understand. Is this a result of my kaijin transformation? I do remember something about grief and trauma in the books that the rodent provided me. I'll have to look into it. But as Gajira watched, he noticed something out of the corner of his eye, the running form of the jetted one. Taking a whiff, his eyes widened slightly, even from here. And the distance between them, the stench of grief, worry and despair was intoxicating. Interesting. Gajira. Two days later, Gajira stood with his arms crossed as he leaned on the interior door frame of Class 1A, a grumble already rising in his throat as he heard the footsteps of the jetted one growing closer and closer. Given the rain outside, there was a slight splashing mixed into the jetted one's sound. It's so weird that people recognize us from TV. Gajira turned his head to look at the pink one. Everyone wanted to talk to me on my way here. The red-haired one nodded and pointed at himself. Yeah, me too. The invisible one joined in. People on the street were staring at me. It was kind of embarrassing Gajira scoffed at her words. Must have been real hard for people to stare at something invisible. Sure, but isn't that pretty normal for you? The tailed one asked, mirroring Gajira's thoughts somewhat. You won't believe what a bunch of elementary school brats yelled at me. The elbowed one said angrily. Nice try. Both Gajira and the frog one snarked in unison, earning laughs from the others and making the elbowed one cry out in frustration. Hearing the scraping of a chair behind him, Gajira realized with a start that Midoriya and the jetted one had entered the room without his acknowledgement. So walking up to Midoriya, he nodded at him, earning a smile from the boy before continuing to the back of the room, where he began to lean against the wall there. 
All it took was one sports festival and suddenly we're like celebrities, said the blonde one. Yeah, this school really is amazing the small insect agreed. Smelling the approach of Aizawa, Kajira looked expectantly towards the door, which opened shortly after. Morning Aizawa greeted blankly. Good morning, Mr. Aizawa. Class 1 Akorust. Kajira blinked in satisfaction seeing the absence of bandages on Aizawa's frame. The frog one noticed it as well. Ribbit, Mr. Aizawa. You don't have bandages anymore. That's good news Aizawa scratched under his left eye, saying. The old lady went a little overboard in her treatment. Anyway, we have a big class today on hero informatics. Phew the flash of dread in class 1A. You need codenames. Kajira blinked in confusion at Aizawa's words. Codenames. Time to pick your hero identities Aizawa continued, making all of class 1 a shout out in excitement. This is gonna be totally awesome. Aizawa growled and activated his quirk, which made his eyes glow red and his hair float. This quickly quieted the children. This is related to the pro-hero draft picks that I mentioned the last time we were in class together. Normally, students don't have to worry about the draft yet. Not until their second or third year actually. But your class is different. In fact, by extending offers to first years like you, pros are essentially investing in your potential. Any offers can be rescinded if their interest in you dies down before graduation, though. Aizawa continued. The small insect hit his table, stupid selfish adults he muttered. So, what you're saying is, we'll still have to prove ourselves after we've gotten recruited the invisible girl asked. Aizawa nodded, correct. Now, here are the totals for those of you who got offers. Pressing a button on a remote, a screen came to life behind Aizawa showcasing numbers and names that Kajira could thankfully now read, and nodded in satisfaction upon seeing Midoriya's score. Shoto Todoroki, 4123. Katsuki Bakugu. 3,556 Izuku Midoriya 1,000 Fumikage Takoyami 360 Tenya Eda 301 Denki Kaminari 272 Momoye Urazu 108 Anjiro Kirishima 68 Achako Uraraka 20 Hanta Siro 14 In past years, it's been more spread out, but there's a pretty big gap this time. Aizawa informed them, making the blonde one throw his head back in frustration. Gah! That's not fair. How about the real star moi? Asked the third blonde one, while the pink one was fuming. Todoroki got the most, ahead of Bakugu. The weird-eared one asked, Yeah, it's the opposite of how they placed in the sports festival. They probably weren't excited about working with the guy who had to be chained up at the end. He elbowed one whispered, or they were just weak. The second blonde one turned around and shouted at the elbowed one, If I scared a pro, they're just weak. The long-haired one sighed, before turning to face Todoroki and saying, That's amazing. You must be proud. But Todoroki brushed her off. The offers are probably because of my father. Ah yes, the walking barbecue. Meanwhile, Yuraka was shaking the jetted one crying, people want us. While the small insect was attempting to strangle Midoriya. You stole all my offers, traitor. Despite these results, you'll all be interning with pros. Got it. Even those of you who didn't get any offers Kajira frowned at Aizawa's words. And seeing this Aizawa confirmed his suspicions. Yes, you will be interning as well, Kajira. You aren't exempt from this, even without any offers. Kajira's eyes widened as he realized something, and silence befell the classroom. If I'm interning, that means. His eyes quickly scanned the list again, and again, anger mounting each time, until a dark aura of barely contained fury surrounded him, and his upped face was shadowed. A why you okay Kajira? The blonde one asked. Anyone watching would have seen a red light coming from Kajira's right eye as he glared at the blonde with such intensity that he turned white from fear. Someone with fucking elbows got more offers than me. A demonic smile, full of teeth, grew on Gajira's face as a light manacle smile grew and laughter accompanied it. Eret Sangwis at Moore's Gajira said, his voice deep, ancient and so powerful with such domination that it made all of the boys turn white and the girls red, with the long-haired one being a combination of both. Did he just speak Latin? The elbowed one gulped. Aizawa coughed, reclaiming the attention of Class 1A, although Gajira didn't stop smiling like a maniac. Well, anyway. You all got to experience combat with real villains during the USJ, but it'll still be helpful to see pros at work, up close and personal, in the field, firsthand. And for that, we need hero names. The lipped one said, Things are suddenly getting a lot more fun. Yuraraka shouted while Gajira was shaken from his bloodlust and back to reality when a familiar scent approached. Oh great, these hero names will likely be temporary, but take them seriously or... Suddenly the door opened and a feminine voice interrupted Aizawa. You'll have hell to pay later. The boys of the class all gasped. With the exceptions of Todoroki and Blonde Number 2, what you pick today could be your code name for life. You better be careful, or you'll be stuck with something utterly indecent Midnight said entering the room. It's midnight. Multiple students shouted. 
Yeah, she's got a good point. Aizawa said as Midnight walked up next to him a big smile on her face, which seemed to falter when she realized he was there, but it quickly returned, even bigger than before. Midnight is going to have final approval over your names. It's not my forte Aizawa leaned down and picked up a sleeping bag. The name you give yourself is important. It helps reinforce your image and shows what kind of hero you want to be in the future. A code name tells people exactly what you represent. Take All Might for example. His piece completed. Aizawa stepped into the sleeping bag and sunk down behind the table. The sound of his breathing was a telltale that he was already asleep, feeling something tapping his arm. Kajira looked down to see the long-haired one handing him a whiteboard and pen. A hero name. But what? I've never had a need for one before. Although, why should I think of a new one when I already have one? Kajira nearly smiled as, thanks to his atomically charged brain, wrote down his hero name and title. Ten minutes later. Now students, who among you is ready to share? Midnight asked, prompting the red-haired one to gasp, and the elbowed one to gulp and dread. After a moment of silence, the third blonde one stood up and walked to the front of the room with a wide smile on his face. Hold your breath the shining hero. He then lifted the board as he announced his hero name. My name is, I can not stop twinkling. Gajira spat up water in surprise at the announcement, Monami's. You can't deny my sparkle. Finally recovering from his surprise, how about twinkle twinkle blonde number three? Gajira snarked, earning several giggles from the children who were otherwise staring at blonde number three in shock. Midnight quickly took blonde number three's board and wrote on it said, it'll be better this way. Take out the eye and shorten the cannot to can't Midnight then showed blonde number three his new hero name, making Gajira deadpan. She likes it. Once blonde number three sat back down, the pink one was eager to go next. Okie dokie, let me go next. Standing behind the table, she showed them her hero's name. My code name, Alien Queen. Gajira nearly choked at the name. Flashes of Gidor racing through his mind. Hold on. Like that horrible monster with the acidic blood. I don't think so Midnight said, clearly imagining something terrible. Just be happy she didn't go for the golden hydra kind. Kajira muttered under his breath, gaining a sideways glance from the weird-eared one, to which he glared at her. Dang it. The pink one said as she returned to her seat. That one wasn't okay. Multiple students asked. The frog one put her hand up next. I think I've got one. Okay if I go next. Midnight pointed at the frog one smiling, go right up. The frog one approached the bench, saying, I've had this one in mind since grade school. Rainy season hero, Froppy the frog one declared, showing them the board. Midnight practically slid behind the frog one. That's delightful. It makes you sound approachable. What a great example of a name everyone will love. In response to that, the children of class wanna began to chant out the name Froppy. Froppy, 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 thank Froppy. Finally, a normal one. The red-headed one was next and he slammed his board down on the bench. I've got mine too. The sturdy hero. My name is Red Riot. Midnight blinked, Red Riot. Interesting. You're paying homage to the chivalrous hero, Crimson Riot? Yes. The red-headed one nodded. That's right. He may be kind of old school, but someday I want to be just like he was. Crimson is my idol. Midnight nodded. If you're bearing the name of someone you admire, you have that much more to live up to. The red-headed one nodded, I accept the challenge. From that point, Kajira began to filter out the majority of noise in the room, with the exception of the hero names. Weird Ear was the hearing hero, I'm Earphone Jack. Multi-armed was the tentacle hero, Tentacle. Albo was the taping hero, Cellophane. Tail was the martial arts hero, Tailman. Lips was I'm the sweets hero, Sugarman. The pink one returned shouting, Pinky, which actually passed. Blonde number one was stun gun hero, I am chargeabolt, electric doncha think. Invisible was the stealth hero, invisible girl. Long hair was the everything hero, I'm creative. Todoroki was simply his first name Shoto. Bird was jet black hero, Tsukayomi. Small insect was fresh picked hero, grape juice. Rockhead was petting hero, anima. Blonde number two originally was king explosion murder which did not pass. Iraraka was uravity. Jetted was Tenya which surprised Gajira, but he didn't think about it. Shocking Gajira, Midoriya chose the hero named Deku. Blonde number two was back with Lord Explosion Murder, which again failed. Finally, it was Gajira's turn. Gajira, are you ready? Midnight asked. Gajira nodded, stood up and walked to the front. Something I was called a while back and will be called again. I am the king of the monsters, Godzilla. Once Aizawa woke up, now that everyone's decided on their hero names, we can go back to talking about your upcoming internships. They'll last for one week. As for who you'll be working with, those of you who are on the board will choose from among your offers. Everyone else will have a different list. You have a lot to think about. There are around 40 agencies across the country who've agreed to take on interns from your class. Each agency has a different specialty that its heroes focus on. Keep that in mind. Midnight began to speak. Imagine if you were 13. You'd want to choose a place that focuses on rescuing people, 
not fighting villains. Understand, think carefully before you decide. Oh and Gajira, follow us outside. We've got something to tell you about your internship. Just as Gajira nodded, the end of period bell rang, and following the two pro heroes Gajira left the room. What is it? He asked once the door was closed, and Aizawa sighed. Against my better judgment, Nezu has already chosen who you're interning with. Gajira raised an eyebrow. So that means it's someone he needed to reach out to for. This could be. Mount Lady, Midnight said. The resulting silence was so deafening that even the cricket didn't chirp. I'm sorry what? Gajira asked in disbelief and confusion. Aizawa sighed. Principal Nezu thought it best that you did your internship with Mount Lady. She knows how to deal with publicity and be positive, as well as being aware of her surroundings due to her quirk. Gajira grumbled, I know. Can't I just intern with Godzilla? This is absurd. I'm the fucking king of the Titans. And yet here I am asking to intern under a fucking mortal? Midnight chuckled. Sorry Big G, but Nezu's word is final. Gajira's right eye refused to stop twitching. And he cursed the rodent for making his life hell, before promising to make his life hell one day. Returning to the classroom, Gajira was just in time to hear the small insect speak. Mount Lady's my top choice this made Gajira stop his eyes quickly widening. No, no, Nuo, the frog one walked past small insect. Not even stopping as she said, Minta, are you thinking something perverted? Small insect turned his head around slowly, possibly. Gajira looked back at the retreating forms of Aizawa and Midnight, shaking a fist in their direction as the cowards ran away. You'll pay for this, he shouted. Two days later, everyone has their costumes right. Aizawa asked. Kajira subconsciously nodded, feeling the weight of the suitcase in his right hand, as he stood directly in front of the small insect. Apparently, it hadn't been an option for having a hero costume, so begrudgingly Gajira had done some research into what design he would want. That and combined with ideas from Midoriya had eventually resulted in a hero costume that he decided was passable, although he was yet to see what it looked like when he actually wore it. Remember, with the exception of Kajira, you don't have permission to wear them out in public yet, and don't lose them or anything, Aizawa said. The pink one jumped on one leg while lifting the other, gotcha, speak properly. It's, yes, sir, Ashido. The pink one quickly sunk down, saying, yes sir make sure you mind your manners with the other heroes during your internships, now get to it. Aizawa said, and Gajira nodded, very well. Gajira turned around to walk in front of Small Insect when he saw Midoriya running up to jet it. Ida, wait. Gajira was about to follow. When the Small Insect's voice caught his attention, come on Gajira. If we don't leave now we'll miss our train. Gajira growled, turned around, and stormed in the direction of his train, whacking Small Insect lightly as he did, sending him flying into the train as a result. One hour later, try as he might, Gajira couldn't stop the repetitive tapping of his right foot on the concrete floor as he, and Small Insect, waited outside. So, uh, you like Mount Lady too, Small Insect said attempting to break the silence. Gajira didn't even look at him. I am here because Nezu gave me no choice, outside of destruction, desecration of public property or having to stay in UA for an additional year and change my hero name to Nuclear Iggy. It had been the last part that truly made Gajira choose to attend the internship. He was not being called Nuclear Iggy, no way, no how. Finally, just as Gajira decided to break down the door to the Mount Agency and blame Small Insect, the door opened to reveal Mount Shorty standing there eating a sandwich. As soon as she laid eyes on them she stopped and blinked several times, her eyes flickering between the two. A moment later she swallowed and said, Well, about time you got here. Come on in, I've got work for you. Gajira rolled his eyes, while Small Insect was drooling at the pro heroine, but nevertheless followed her into the building. As soon as Gajira entered, he frowned. He wasn't well versed in cleanliness, but he was pretty sure that buildings weren't meant to look like this. Okay, the vacuums are over there. Get cleaning, she said as she jumped onto a lounge and picked up a magazine to read. Small insect, and he both stared at the woman for a moment, who then looked over at them and winked. If you do good, I might give you a special surprise. Instantly, small insect turned red and shouted, yes ma'am, and rushed off to clean. However, Kajira merely glared at the woman. I am not your pet. Mount Shorty, the heroine frowned and pointed at him lazily. You agreed to the internship, that means you gotta do what I say for the rest of the week. Otherwise, I might just kick you out. Unless you want to be rough. Kajira scoffed at the woman's suggestive and seductive tone, I am not so easily manipulated, mortal. I was sent here because I was told you would assist in my public image and caution around civilians and buildings. If you will not teach, I will learn myself. Kajira turned around and walked up the stairs and into a bathroom, leaving a spluttering Mount Shorty not revealing the truer reason he left. I also don't need to remind her that anything I do while under her guidance is directly inflicted upon her, not me. So I have a free pass to do whatever the fuck I want. Once he found a bathroom to get changed in, he decided that he would go on patrol like he had while he still worked with Godzilla in America. 
It was a fun and effective way to let off some steam, while also training on the rare occasion that a powerful opponent showed up. Opening the suitcase that contained his hero suit, his eyebrows instantly raised in surprise and a hint of awe. I knew the suit would be good, but this far exceeds my expectations, he muttered, as he got dressed. The suit was highly reminiscent of ancient Japanese armor specifically the samurai, which he had requested. All in shades of black, dark navy, or atomic blue, he marveled at the attire. The top was simple, a black sleeveless and skin-tight shirt, with a bronze plate at the brim with the Japanese kanji for Gajira on it, while on the back of the shirt was an image of him moving in an Ouroboros fashion, the same tattoo on his back, due to his kaijin forearms. There was nothing for his arms or the rest of his upper torso. However, the bottom half was a different story. For the pants, he had a simple yet embroidered pair of dark navy pants, not too dissimilar from what the ancient ninja wore. He also had plates of armor named Kusizuri, which protected his upper legs. There was a third piece that went down between his legs and was capped off by more bronze, while also having the same symbol from his back near the bottom and while held up by a belt. He tied another piece of cloth around the Kasizuri with a piece of rope, attaching a blue piece of cloth which would hang down his left leg. Finally, there was a pair of armored sandals, attached at the back. They appeared as him simply wearing shin guards over his sandals. They, like the rest of his armor, were not only black with atomic blue shades mixed in but were made from scales that he shed like a person losing single strands of hair. Completely natural, meaning they were not only stronger and harder than diamonds and steel but would channel his atomic energy exceedingly well. An added bonus was the fact that it was not only waterproof but also supremely comfortable. Kajira wasn't vain, but he did admire himself in a mirror for a moment while doing some light shadow boxing and poses to further enhance his majesticness. I'm starting to sound like blonde number three. Kajira shook his head, turned around and opened a nearby window, before jumping out in search of entertainment and perhaps a challenge. Aizawa. Fifteen minutes later, Aizawa sighed contently as he lay on the floor. However, his relaxation would not last as the buzzing of his phone would make itself known. Grumbling, Aizawa brought the phone up to his ear and pressed accept. Hello, he asked. Well, oh, eraser head. We've got a problem, came Mount Lady's voice. Great, now what's my gone and done? What is it? Aizawa asked. It's Kajira. Aizawa frowned. What about him? He's gone. Motherfucker. Kajira. Be back off man. I swear I'll do it. Kajira was currently standing in front of a villain threatening an entire block of mortals whose quirk allowed him to generate nuclear energy. Had it been any other hero, the villain likely would have gotten his ransom of 100 million lian, but sadly for the villain, Kajira eat, sleeped and breathed nuclear radiation. But the villain didn't know that. Kajira scoffed. Really? The go ahead. Do it? There was no doubt in his mind that this villain was as green as his outfit, which was to say, I meltingly so. The hesitation, wavering voice. And terrible outfit all pointed in that direction, as did the proclamation of his quirk. The villain growled, before saying, fine, you asked for it. Then raising his right hand, a sphere of nuclear radiation formed, around equal in force to a missile, although the radiation would make at least half of the neighboring area unlivable. Radiation blast, the villain shouted throwing the sphere at Kajira, who didn't even move. Once the sphere made contact, Kajira grunted, it had a tad more force than he expected, but that didn't matter, making a sucking movement. Kajira grinned as he drank the radiation the way someone would drink water with a straw or a piece of spaghetti. Once it was all gone, Kajira burped quietly in satisfaction feeling his radiation reserves fill. While he naturally generated nuclear radiation, he would never say no to some extra. What impossible? The villain shouted in shock and fear. Kajira chuckled seeing the absolute disbelief on the villain's face. You have no idea what's possible. Now come quietly, or do me a favor and don't. The villain scowled, never, and charged at him, his hands glowing green with radiation. Kajira merely rolled his eyes. Did this idiot even hear? Radioactive strike. As soon as the blow made contact, Kajira was sent flying up into the air and off his feet by the knockback. His eyes widened with shock as he crashed on the ground, making a small crater from the impact. What the fuck? Looking up in surprise, Kajira saw the villain grinning. Weren't expecting that were ya? Kajira nearly shook his head. He hadn't. Standing up. Kajira moved his jaw around to check for any injuries at the point of contact but found none. As I suspected, he doesn't have the power to actually injure me, but by using radiation to augment his attacks, he was able to send me flying with the knockback. But let's see how he likes radiation. Kajira readied himself into a fighting stance against the villain, before planting his feet on the ground and slamming his tail on it. Slowly, his dorsal plates began to glow blue and a humming sound filled the air as he charged his atomic breath. The villain frowned. What are you taking a deep breath? Kajira shouted at the villain as he unleashed a massive beam of blue flame straight at the villain colliding with him. And after a moment of resistance, the atomic beam completely consumed the villain and shot off into the sky. 
Clamping his mouth shut, Kajira huffed and nodded in satisfaction. Turning around he prepared to continue his patrol when suddenly something hit him square in the back, sending him tumbling. Crashing into a wall, Kajira coughed up blood, his eyes wide in shock at the pain he felt. What the fuck? Landing on the ground, Kajira looked up snarling, seeing a glowing blue figure emerge from the shadows, laughing maniacally. Wow, what a rush. I never knew someone else had a radiation quirk, much less something this powerful. Kajira's eyes widened in surprise as the radiation villain walked forward, his previously green outfit now atomic blue and flaming like the walking barbecue. He can absorb my atomic radiation. The villain then looked at Kajira as he stood up, ignoring the pain he already felt. Let's go, buddy. I want to taste more of that power. Kajira growled as the villain charged at him. Then he charged as well, roaring in anger as he did. S-S-S-H-R-R-E-E-O-O-O-N-N-K-K-K. Kajira. S-S-H-R-R-E-E-O-O-O-N-N-K-K-K. Kajira roared as he charged at the villain, who shouted kindly. The force of their collision created a shockwave that extinguished all nearby flames, cleared any fog and cloud, and pushed back anyone nearby. Shouting, Kajira drove his knee into the villain's stomach, before twisting his torso to toss the villain into a wall. Following quickly he rushed the villain but was blindsided by a blast of radiation that temporarily blinded him. Almost immediately a powerful fist drove itself into his stomach, making him spit as he was thrown back. Twisting himself in the air, Kajira landed on his feet and using his tail to stabilize himself, glared at the villain. Surrender, the villain shouted, but Kajira bared his teeth in response, I bow to none. The villain frowned and formed a pair of atomic spheres, nuclear strike. He shouted, throwing the spheres at Kajira, quickly charging an atomic beam. Kajira roared as the radiation erupted from his mouth, colliding with the spheres and making them explode, closing his mouth quickly. So as to not give the villain further radiation, Kajira drove his hands into the ground, before ripping out a boulder and throwing it at the villain, who with wide eyes jumped above to dodge it. Grinning, Kajira slammed his tail into the ground to throw himself at the villain and spinning around whacked him into the earth with his tail, before rocketing to the ground himself and slamming into the villain. Once the dust cleared, Kajira reached down and picked the villain up by the neck using his tail. The villain choked and clawed at his tail in vain, and Kajira brought him closer so that he could look into the villain's eyes. You will wish you never met me, insect Kajira said. But as he spoke suddenly the villain grinned and grabbed Kajira's head, instinctively reaching up to tear the villain's hands off. Suddenly an agonizing pain consumed him, releasing the villain and dropping to his knees in agony. Kajira screamed in pain. Izuku, boy, come here. You need to see this. Izuku looked up from his notebook as Gran Torino shouted, Coming. Izuku called, rushing over to the aged hero in the living room. What is? Izuku trailed off as he saw what was on the TV. His eyes widened and an icy fear tore into his heart. Kajira was on his knees, screaming in agony as a villain he didn't recognize held onto his head, seemingly siphoning energy from him. Izuku's eyes widened further as he saw the nuclear symbol on the villain's chest and realized what was happening. He is taking Kajira's radiation. Godzilla, America. Godzilla dusted his hands off and nodded at the police as they took away the villains in chains. When suddenly his phone rang. Reaching into his pocket he saw a text from Masui, simply reading, You need to see this with a link attached. Frowning he pressed the link, and instantly his eyes widened in shock. Gajira. The man hummed as he watched the fight between Gajira and Radiant. He had expected Radiant to challenge Gajira. Not outright put him on his knees. Q guy, what is this? He asked. I believe that Radian is forcefully taking Namuji's radiation, causing him immense pain in the process. However, this may be a blessing in disguise. No one has challenged Namuji in such a way so far as Radian is. This may force him to dig deeper than ever before have the bomb ready to detonate at a moment's notice. Namuji is far too valuable to lose to someone like Radian. But do not detonate unless I tell you understand. Yes master. Kajira. Kajira could only scream as a pain unlike anything he could ever imagine ripped through his veins. It boiled his organs, ravaged his lungs, it consumed him in every way. He fell to the ground, barely managing to hold himself up with his hands. Make the pain stop. He managed to think. Surely someone, why am I begging? If I can't save myself. Managing a weak roar, Kajira used the last of his strength to whack the villain away. As soon as the pain ended he took a gasp of air, panting and sweating. Then slowly, he struggled to his feet, standing up to face the villain who was clapping, I must thank you. For making my debut so great. The villain then launched himself at Kajira, appearing in front of him and acting faster than Kajira could react, uppercutting him into the air. Then reappeared above him and kicked him down to the ground making another shockwave from the force behind it. Kajira gasped as the air was knocked out of him, and blood and spit erupted from his throat. Shit, this guy's too strong. I can't beat him. As Kajira looked at the villain who was dusting off his hands, he tried to stand but found the effort void. And as his vision went dark, he was only left with one thought. 
I'm lost. Father, you can't lose now. Fight on. Fight for me. No, don't. Together we shall stand. Forget the sins of the past and move forward. You are weak. You cannot even protect those you call your family. I only bow to the strong. Tell me Alpha, are you strong? Long live the king. His eyes snapped open as words, as voices, from the past shot through his mind. J.R., Minola, the winged one, himself, the rival, Gidor, the flaming one and then the voices of all his allies roaring alongside that of humanity. And as the villain turned his back on him, with renewed strength he stood, and he clenched his fists as blue flames erupted from them. Izuku. Izuku's blood ran cold as ice as he stared at the prone figure of Gajira, his costume in tatters, his chest completely bare, tears already falling down his face, and his throat was already sharp and rough. No, Gajira, this can't be happening. He muttered as he fell to his knees. Even with one for all, I can't save him. I'm not fast enough. Despair consumed his heart. And he felt the hand of Grand Torino patting his back. Don't worry kid, I don't think your friend's done yet. Izuku's head shot up and a smile of relief, of hope, grew upon his face as he saw Gajira standing. Then his eyes widened in confusion and surprise as blue flames erupted from the kaijin's hands and eyes. Nezu, all of the staff of Yue stood in mixtures of anticipation. Hope and dread as they saw Gajira stand. The sounds of scraping chairs accompanied this, as well as a growing smile on Nezu's face as he saw blue flames erupt to life in both Gajira's eyes and hands. I think we're about to witness one hell of a show. Nezu crackled in excitement, already recording the video. Godzilla, America. Godzilla's grin was all teeth and relief as he watched Gajira stand. Albeit, with a stumble, he still stood. That's it. Show them. He muttered a shiver of excitement creeping up his spine. His grin could only grow wider as he saw blue flames erupt to life in Kajira's hands and eyes. Show them that a kaiju bows to none. Kajira. Kajira opened his mouth and growled lightly, his breath steaming against the cold crisp air a faint blue light illuminating it. Clenching and unclenching his fists, he continued to direct his atomic power into them, into him. His sight was brighter, his hearing sharper, his smell greater. It felt like all that he was, all that he is, had awoken once more. Every sense was amplified, every muscle strengthened, he felt more alive than he had ever before, and it was so much more. He could see everything, every stone on the ground, every hair on the villain's neck, he could see the airwaves. He could see the hot and cold, and he could see the radiation that flowed around him, within him, and within the villain as well. He was one with nature itself. Izuku. Izuku could only watch on in awe as Kajira stood, for not only were blue flames erupting from Kajira but his very body was changing. The black scales that covered Gajira's forearms grew to cover his entire arms, as well as the sides and bottom of his chest, leaving only his abs and chest bare. His back was covered in scales as well. And as Izuku watched dorsal plates, the same as the ones on Gajira's tail, grew out of his back in three rows, the ones on his upper back being the largest of all. The rows continued up Gajira's neck and to the top of his head where they vanished into his long black hair. Gajira's eyes were completely red and slitted. Black scales covered the sides of his face, as well as under his eyes which also faintly glowed atomic blue, just like the interior of Gajira's mouth. His teeth became serrated, sharpened, the teeth of a predator, and he grew taller, moving from 7 feet to 10. His tail lengthened and thickened as well, going from 10 feet to 14 8. A faint blue aura appeared around Gajira, liquid-like wisps that danced and swayed in the wind. The villain stopped seemingly sensing Gajira's presence and turned around. So, you still had that up your sleeve? But even as the villain shot towards Kajira, Izuku's smile didn't leave his face, and fear was but a mere afterthought. For the battle had begun anew, and he knew that Kajira would win. Kajira. Kajira leveled his gaze upon the villain. Patty et your akoram irami. For there is no hope. The villain laughed. A glow up isn't going to save you mutant. Although I'll admit it does look cool. Kajira growled and began to walk towards the villain. Slowly, relentlessly. Disturbed by the change in Gajira, the villain took a step back before growling in turn. I'm not weak. He then glared at Gajira, who continued his approach. I'm not weak. He shouted charging at Gajira. Gajira narrowed his eyes, and bringing back his right arm, met the villain's fist with his own. Atomic radiation exploded from the impact, erupting like a burst geyser into the air above. The villain's eyes widened with surprise. Bringing back his left arm, Gajira went to uppercut the villain. However, the villain grabbed his fist and brought them to a standstill, both fighting for dominance over the other. But the stalemate didn't last long, as Gajira brought his tail up and slammed the villain in the side, sending him tumbling across the ground. Gajira hummed in amusement, looking at himself for a moment. Interesting. This form is far more similar to my true form to my kaijin form, and far stronger. Looking up, Gajira saw the villain lifting a building-sized boulder and with a yell tossing it at him. Eat this. Kajira scoffed. 
and taking a deep breath, released a massive beam of atomic energy straight through the boulder, destroying it completely. However, the beam didn't last a second more, as Gajira gasped as the villain drove his elbow into his chest, knocking the wind out of him. Stumbling back, Gajira gasped and growled as the villain's grin returned to his face. You're not invincible then with a shout he charged at Gajira, who narrowed his eyes and mirrored the villain's movements. Once they met, the villain's hands became a blur as he unleashed a barrage of punches onto Gajira, quickly raising his own hands. Gajira did what he could to defend against the seemingly endless blows. However slowly he was driven back, the ground at his feet cracking and breaking from the force of the villain's strikes. How? How is he pushing me back? My power is far greater than his. Then as the villain finally broke his guard, he hit Gajira in the chest with a flat palm, before spinning around and kicking him in the side of the head, making Gajira spin around and stumble as a result. This power of yours, it's definitely powerful, but you're weakening quickly. Your radiation is plummeting. You won't be able to sustain this for long, Gajira growled, standing tall and facing the villain. Time is not my concern, said Tum Pro. The villain laughed, arrogant, stupid and prideful. Unbelievable. Oh well, I'll just beat you into the ground once I'm ready. Kajira snarled and leapt at the villain, igniting his fists with atomic flames as he did. S-S-S-H-R-E-E-O-O-N-N-K-K. He was in awe at the display of power that he was witness to. Incredible. Such power, such ferocity. Namuji is one step closer to perfection. There is still the issue of his alliance with the heroes. Hudai said, it doesn't matter. It will cause panic and chaos with his mere existence. And if he turns against us, well, that's what Namu Zero is for isn't he? Gajira. Gajira shouted in pain as the villain kicked him in the side, before roundhousing him in the face. Clenching his jaw, he grabbed the villain's leg and threw him away in anger, then rushing at the villain as he had the upper hand. Igniting his fists once again, he repeatedly struck the villain's guard, each blow driving the villain deeper and deeper into the ground, yet each blow pushed him less and less. I need to end this quickly. With a roar, Gajira kicked the villain, sending him flying, before ripping a nearby building out of the ground, lifting it above his head. He shouted wordlessly as he tossed it at the villain. However, a blue light suddenly erupted from the villain, and the building was instantly destroyed, turned to rubble as it fell around him. You're out of time, the villain said, his eyes now glowing blue. The ground cracked at the villain's feet, before with a yell, he drove his fist into the ground, sending a wave of atomic energy straight at Kajira. His eyes widening, Kajira attempted to dodge the attack leaping into the air to do so. But the villain appeared above Gajira, and with a grin on his face, punched Gajira into the wave, and it burned. G-G-R-A-A-H-H. Gajira screamed at the pain that engulfed him once again. Then in quick succession, the villain shouted, Radiation stream. And the atomic wave exploded. The sheer force of the impact leveled all buildings in a 10-kilometer radius, and Gajira was at the center of it. The air was ripped from his lungs, and smoke replaced it. With the black fog filling his lungs, Gajira coughed as he suffocated. Falling to his knees he released a small atomic pulse to clear the smoke and dust. And, I was right. You lose the villain said as he looked at Gajira, his arms crossed. Gajira looked up at him and growled. I will not lose. Non sum victus the villain scoffed. Have you even looked at yourself? You're exhausted. Your radiation is nearly gone. Even with that form, you stood no chance. Gajira growled, before standing up once more. Mortal, I am Godzilla, the king of the monsters. Apisum Rapex, I fight till death. The villain laughed, fine, I'll just kill you with one more blow. The villain then leapt away, and his entire body began to glow. The stones around him rose as they defied gravity, and clouds began to gather in the once clear sky, swirling around the villain. Kajira narrowed his eyes as he swayed on his feet. Exhaustion was right, he was nearly done for. I'll just dodge his attack, encounter. Oh, and if you dodge this, it'll destroy the city behind you. The villain shouted. Kajira's eyes widened and he glanced behind him, his enhanced vision not only spotting the city but the civilians and people who lived there. He instantly turned his gaze back to the villain. But before he could formulate a plan, the villain shouted, Nuclear Flare. And as the blue energy erupted to the side of him like a shield, an even larger beam exploded towards Kajira, who braced himself for the impact. The resulting explosion shook the earth itself, tore through the earth and formed a small canyon that led straight to Kajira. The villain laughed, finally. He's Dio for fuck's sake. For as the smoke cleared, it revealed Gajira still stood. His skin was charred and burned, smoke rising from his body from the heat. Gajira looked up. I suddenly he broke into a coughing fit, spitting blood as his entire upper body shook. But he didn't kneel, as once the fit was over, he returned his gaze to the villain. I am not dead yet. The villain scoffed. It doesn't matter. You'll die this time. And the villain began to charge another nuclear flare. I won't survive another, even with enhanced healing. 
I must end him before he can fire that. But how? As Gajira rummaged through his brain for the answer the image of Midoriya channeling all of his power into one limb to unleash a devastating attack came to mind, followed by All Might striking him with his bare hands, and an idea along with it. Gajira grinned, and slowly began to walk towards the villain as he glowed brighter and brighter. The further he went, the faster he went, picking up speed until he was running dead straight at the villain and gathering all his remaining radiation into his right arm. So you wanna die faster? Fine then. Nuclear flare. The villain shouted as he once again unleashed the attack with Gajira mere feet away from him. Drawing his right arm back, Gajira felt the atomic flames ignite into an inferno and as he drove the fist against the nuclear flare, pushing further and further towards the villain, then as he made contact with the villain's face he shouted, Atomic smash, Izuku, atomic smash. Izuku's eyes widened as Gajira drove his fist through the villain's nuclear flare, completely nullifying the attack. Then the smash slammed into the villain, completely shattering the ground below without any effort and from the looks of things causing an earthquake as he did. The villain was thrown away by the force, and Gajira panted in exhaustion. But he stood tall, and as the camera switched off, Izuku grinned. Gajira had won. Gajira. Well, that was fun. Panting, Gajira looked around at the absolute devastation his atomic smash had caused. He wondered for a moment what drove him to name the attack. But a faint smile played on his lips as the image of Midoriya flashed through his mind. Standing tall, he cracked his back and shoulders as he wiggled them around. Today had certainly been far more entertaining than he expected. But as he turned to return to Mount Agency and get some rest, he heard the shifting of rubble behind him, spinning around. Kajira groaned in annoyance as the nuclear villain was standing once again. But this time, his outfit was green. I'm not done yet, the villain shouted as he charged at him. Casually, Kajira raised his right arm and grabbed the villain's fist, shocking him. What? In the same manner, Kajira lifted the villain over his head and swung him around before tossing him twenty feet into the air. Then almost without effort, he whacked the villain into the ground as soon as he was in range. You are out of atomic radiation. Stolt is pure. Looking down at the villain, he planted his right foot onto the villain's chest, saying, Bow down, and you will not suffer. Did Ishinamet finds the villain growled? Never. I'd rather die. Gajira scoffed. Then you will. Lent a Cidolans the villain's eyes widened as Gajira's tail wrapped around his throat. And after stepping off the villain, he began to smash him repeatedly into the ground. Again, and again, and again. Until blood watered the earth until the thirst was quenched, bringing the villain up above his head. He swung him around in an arc before throwing him into a nearby boulder, completely destroying it upon impact. Snorting, Kajira walked up to the figure of the villain, embedded in the boulder, grabbing him by the neck with his right arm. Kajira lifted him up into the air. Please, mercy the villain begged. But Kajira smirked evilly. Pinatet, fresh out of mercy as the villain's eyes widened, Kajira broke the villain's neck like a twig before dropping the limp figure. Then turning his gaze to the sky moments before exhaustion took him, he roared his victory. S-S-S-H-H-R-E-E-O-O-O-N-N-K-K. -E -E that night, Kajira opened his eyes slowly. His head rang and his body screamed in protest as he raised his right hand to place it on his head. Oh, he muttered. He then opened his eyes, to see Mount Shorty and small insects sitting at his bedside, both of them asleep. What the fuck? He then realized that small insect's head was resting against Mount Shorty's chest. It didn't take a genius to deduce that he had waited for Mount Shorty to fall asleep before cuddling up with her chest. His already low opinion of small insect fell even further. Kajira proceeded to glare at insignificant worm. He then noticed that he was back in his kaijin form, and he grumbled unhappily. Here I was thinking I gotta keep that form. Oh well, what's done once can be done again. Now that he was awake, Kajira took a deep breath and focused his healing abilities on one limb at a time, until eventually the soreness of his limbs and muscles was completely gone, sighing contentedly. He suddenly grinned as an idea formed in his mind. Looking around, he spotted a phone which he quickly swiped using his tail. Strangely enough, it was unlocked and brought to him. Then he took a photo of Insignificant Worm and Mount Shorty, before sending the image to the rodent and Aizawa with the words. Blackmail of Insignificant Worm and Mount Shorty is attached. He received a smiley face from the rodent and a thank you from Aizawa. He then proceeded to delete the numbers on the phone and return it to where he found it. Deciding he didn't want to deal with the duo, he carefully stood up and left the room, making sure not to wake the mortals. However, as he left the room, he decided to test something. Focusing on his vision, he closed his eyes, and when he opened them, he was seeing an infrared. A grin flickered across his face as he swapped through sight times, airwaves, radiation, night vision, even minor electroreception, as well as one that just looked like his normal vision but was far sharper and more accurate. He chuckled, perfect, now I can see everything. Once again. But before Gajira could take another step, he heard Mount Shorty's voice speak up behind him. Now where do you think you're going? Deciding to stay in the unnamed vision, he turned to look at Mount Shorty. 
Back to the Mount Agency. I'm not sleeping in a hospital bed. Mount Shorty shook her head. You're already in my agency. Duh. Kajira looked to the side to see that indeed he was in the Mount Agency. He grumbled but returned his attention to Mount Shorty. Well, I'm still not sleeping in a hospital bed. I am already healed, he said gruffly. Mount Shorty rolled her eyes. Sure, I heard about your healing factor so I'm already up to date with that. What I mean to say is, why didn't you wake me up? Kajira deadpanned, didn't want to. This made Mount Shorty yelp and yell, you don't need to be so mean about it. Kajira raised an eyebrow, and Mount Shorty sighed, look, I'm sorry, I should have gone with you and actually taught you, but I got caught up in my laziness and I got you hurt, and now dozens of people are homeless. Kajira turned his head and put a hand to his ear, sorry didn't hear that. Why do you say? Mount Shorty growled, grabbed him by the ear and shouted into it, I quote him sorry. Kajira chuckled and after pulling Mount Shorty's arm away from it said, don't need to shout. Oh and, if you're really going to teach me, don't teach insignificant worm. Mount Shorty frowned for a moment before understanding dawned on her and she pointed in the direction of insignificant worm. Oh, okay. Gajira. Two days later, Gajira was crouched on top of a skyscraper, looking down at the city of Hasu. After receiving a message from a worried Midoriya Gajira had asked permission to patrol Hasu that night suspecting the hero killer stain was present. Mount Maid had agreed to this, and in typical fashion didn't tell anything about it to insignificant Worm who was still cleaning at the Mount Agency. Sighing, Gajira was about to move on, when suddenly he heard screaming in the streets below, standing up instantly. He spotted a flying figure down below, identifying it as hostile Gajira grinned as he jumped down onto its back, crashing into the ground below the person's back broke instantly as it died. Gajira chuckled but as he turned his gaze his eyes widened. It wasn't a human, it was a Namu. Namu, more N-O-M-U. Rage instantly engulfed Gajira as he shouted in rage. Turning his gaze he saw another grey Namu readying to attack a pair of civilians. Narrowing his eyes, Gajira shot towards Namu, where are all the pros? The man asked. The Namu raised its arm to attack the civilians. But Gajira grabbed its arm. Hello he greeted. But before he could tear the Namu apart, a yellow-capped midget shot out of nowhere, kicking the Namu in the face and causing it to stumble. I haven't fought this earnestly in years. Picked a fine time to patrol. The old man landed behind the Namu, before taunting it, that's right, bring it on ugly. Namu roared and attempted to punch the old man, but he easily dodged and jumped above the Namu. Kajira scoffed as the Namu turned and attempted to attack him, grabbing its throat he tore it out killing the Namu instantly. Pathetic. This thing is nothing compared to the black one from the USJ Kajira said as he spat on the corpse. Young man you shouldn't have done that. Killing is a serious crime. The old man glared at him, but Kajira huffed. That implies it was alive in the first place. That thing was a walking corpse. The old man raised an eyebrow and Kajira evaluated, it has no intelligence. It's merely an above-average animal. Thus it's not human. Before the old man could respond a familiar voice spoke, I was looking for the elusive hero killer, but I found you instead Kajira. And thanks old timer, I'm afraid I don't know you. However Kajira turned to look at the approaching form of Endeavor and held up a finger. Use my hero name Endeavor. Godzilla. Endeavor raised an eyebrow but shrugged, fine. Godzilla. Whoa, look. The male civilian said, why is he in Hasu? The female asked, HMPH, isn't it obvious? I came because I'm a hero. Gajira scoffed, and I'm here to look for a fight. Endeavor, these Namu are of the same species as what I battled in the USJ. I suspect the gray ones are far weaker than their black counterparts, but be cautious regardless. I can already smell more Namu in Hasu, so I'll go and have fun now. Izuku, where are you, Tenya? Izuku stopped instantly as he heard the shouts of a male hero. Turning he rushed towards the source, and as he rounded a corner he was met with a scene from his nightmares. Standing in front of him were two Namu, a grey one and a massive black one, surrounded by pros, but none of them was Gajira. None of them was All Might. Oh no, it's just like Gajira said. There's more of them. Manuel, stop the fire. Izuku turned his head and saw a bull hero calling out to Manuel after tearing a fire hydrant apart. Yeah, got it. Manuel called running to the hydrant. That's Manuel, the normal hero. It is at his agency. Manuel looked around as he ran. Why the hell do you run off by yourself? Where the hell are you Tenya? Damn it once Manuel reached the hydrant, he shouted and shot the water at the fire. While Izuku stopped. Wait, he went off alone. Despite what's happening, that doesn't sound like something he would do. You're in the way kid. Get out of here Izuku was shaken from his thoughts as he saw a blonde female hero stand between him and the black Nama. Right, I'm so sorry. We can hold these things back on our own. Evacuate with everyone else Izuku was about to nod when Manuel interrupted. I could have used the extra hands. I can't believe Tenya would run off with such a huge disaster right in front of him. But then, something clicked and Izuku's eyes widened. Hasu City. Guys who look like Namu. Ida. Hasu. Where the hero killer attacked. Don't tell me. Turning around, Izuku rushed off, hoping that he was wrong. 
Gajira. Gajira continued to run towards the scent of the Namu, excitement bubbling in his veins. Finally, turning the final corner, he was met by the sight of two Namu, one gray sadly, and one black. A grin grew on his face, and before he stepped forward, an explosion erupted from a crushed car. Crap, what do we do now? A ninja-themed hero asked, are these really men, or are they actual monsters? Another asked. Gajira chuckled, deciding to make himself known as he walked out of the shadows. They are neither man nor monster. They are savage brutes with no sense of self. As such, I will end them. One of the heroes turned to face him. What? Who are you? I am Godzilla, the king of the monsters, he answered simply. At this, one of the pro's eyes widened. I remember you. You were on the news a couple of days ago. You took down that S-rank villain. Gajira nodded. Yep, now I'm here for the Namu. Sue. So, the pros nodded and stepped away from the Namu. While Gajira simply continued his approach, the black one turned once it noticed him, roaring and attempting to punch him with its right arm. But Gajira caught the blow easily. Tilting his head, Gajira sighed. I was right. You are weaker than the one I thought in USJ. Oh well, you'll die the same. Then in one move, he tossed the black Namu into the sky and into the flying gray one. Quickly charging his atomic energy he grinned before shouting, Atomic breath. Tamura Shigaraki. Tamura laughed as he watched the devastation in the streets below. The Namu makes such great playthings. Behind him, Kirijiri asked, Are you not going to participate in the fight? Tamura shook his head and put his left hand on his right shoulder. Don't be stupid. I'm still injured. That's why I bought those pets with us. He said, remembering his earlier conversation with Master, and his surprise when the Master gave him not one, but five Namu. Spreading his arms he laughed maniacally once this night is over. The world will have forgotten you ever existed. Hero Killer. But as he continued to laugh, suddenly a pillar of blue light erupted into the air, cutting him off. What wait, I recognize that beam. Don't tell me. He's here. Tamura shouted in shock as the atomic beam soared into the night sky, vanishing. This complicates things. Kirijiri muttered behind him. Gajira. Gajira grumbled as he kicked the ashes of the Namu. Already broke my playthings dammit he muttered. Thanks, Godzilla. You really are powerful. A blue fish hero said. Kajira glanced back at him, yeah, yeah, whatever. Listen, you guys either need to help the evacuation or fight other Namu. The smoke's messing with my sense of smell, but I think there are two more. The pros nodded, what are you going to do? One of the heroes asked, but before he could reply his phone buzzed, and reaching into his pocket he brought it out and checked the image on it. A map from Midoriya, must be a distress signal. I've got something else to take care of, Kajira said, turning around and after catching Midoriya's scent, ran off. Izuku. Izuku gasped in shock as his body went still. My body. Did he cut me and I didn't even notice. One graze is all it took. Izuku checked his arms and seeing a small tear in his outfit, was filled with dread. Stain stood up next to him, and Izuku's eyes widened as he saw a drop of blood on Stain's sword. No, it's the blood. You're not powerful enough. It's not that you predicted my movements. You just left my field of vision and maneuvered so that you'd be able to get in a clean shot. But I saw through your plan. Stain began to walk away from Izuku. There are countless false heroes around here who are all talk. But I think you're worthy of staying alive. You're different from these two. Stain stopped as he arrived at Ida's paralyzed body and raised his sword over his head. Wait, don't. Stop it. Izuku cried get away. Suddenly, a pillar of fire erupted from the street shooting towards Stain, who leapt away from Ida in evasion. Someone else got in my way. Today's been full of distractions. Stain said. Izuku looked at the source of the fire, and a smile spread across his face as he saw Todoroki standing there. Midoriya, you need to give me more details in times like this. Todoroki said holding up a phone displaying the message he sent them. I was almost too late to stop this guy. You too Todoroki. Tenya asked in disbelief. How'd you get here? Izuku asked, before realizing with shock that Todoroki was using fire. Hold on, you're using your left side. Todoroki ignored him. How'd I get here? Good question. Your message took me a while to figure out. Next time, try to send more than just your specific location. But you're not really one to send cryptic messages without a reason, are you? A wave of ice then erupted from Todoroki's right leg, moving them all away from Stain. So I figured you were in trouble and asking for help. Everything's okay. The pro heroes will be here any minute. Todoroki shouted charging at Stain while shooting a ball of fire. You're just what they said you were. But you won't be taking any more lives, hero killer. Todoroki said. Using all the strength he could, Izuku turned to watch the battle between the two. Todoroki, you can't let that guy get your blood. I I think he controls his enemy's actions by swallowing it. That's how he got us. He ingests blood to keep people from moving. That explains the blades. All I've gotta do is keep my distance, Todoroki said, before narrowly avoiding a knife that went for his face. You have good friends and genium. 
Or you did. Stain shouted, twirling the blade around to slice Todoroki in half, only for Todoroki to block it with a wall of ice. Together they both realized the same thing. As they looked up, his sword, Todoroki said. He threw it at the same time as the knife. Suddenly, Stain grabbed Todoroki and attempted to lick the blood off his cheek, but acting quickly he summoned flames that made Stain jump back. He's strong, Todoroki muttered as he threw more ice and fire at Stain. Just stop it. Why are you doing this? His fight is with me. I inherited my brother's name. I'm the one that should stop him. The hero killer is mine. Ida shouted, you're ingenium now. Strange. The ingenium I knew before never had that look on his face. You've got a dark side. Guess my family isn't the only one Todoroki said. Careful, Todoroki. Izuku shouted, trying to move. When he felt his arm twitch. Huh? Suddenly, the ice that Todoroki had made to block out stain was sliced to pieces. It blocked your own field of vision against an opponent who's faster than you. Rookie mistake. Stain said, come get me then. Todoroki challenged as his left arm erupted into flame. Yet the next moment two daggers were embedded in his arm. Looking up, Izuku saw Stain moving down towards the pro hero, you're good kid. Unlike him Izuku tried to stand, but he couldn't. Watch out, Todoroki shouted. Without warning, a car was thrown at Stain, knocking the hero killer away. Izuku's eyes widened and as he turned his head, he smiled hearing the familiar voice. Honestly Midoriya, I leave you alone for three days and this happens? I'm disappointed. Gajira. Gajira. Gajira took in the scene before him. One down Midoriya. One down jetted one, a pro he didn't recognize. Also down, Todoroki with two daggers in his left arm not down. And a vicious hero killer. Yep everyone was here. You, you're that guy from the news two days ago. The one who fought Radiant. The villain said. Gajira nodded. And you are the hero killer. Brain right? He asked. The villain frowned. Stain. Kajira nodded. Sure thing lame. Out of the corner of his eye, Kajira saw Midoriya get to his feet. I'm not sure why, but I'm able to move now. Midoriya said. Kajira raised an eyebrow. Paralysis. Midoriya nodded. By digesting blood he can paralyze others. Todoroki nodded. So he has a time limit that kid should have been the last one to be free. I still can't move a muscle. The pro hero said. I've got three guesses why. His quirk could be less effective the more people he uses it on. The amount ingested could play into how long it works, or there could even be a difference based on a person's blood type. If it's the last one, I'm blood type B, the pro said, I'm type A, the jetted one said, while Gajira just shrugged, no idea. Stain grinned, so, you figured it out. Bravo, very impressive. It doesn't really help us that much to know how his quirk works, though, Midoriya said. I thought we could hurry and carry those two out of here, but it's no good. He's too fast. He can dodge ice and fire. I'd have to leave myself unguarded. Our best option is to hold until the pros arrive and avoid close combat. Todoroki said. Kajira frowned. You forget I'm here. Todoroki, you know you've already lost way too much blood. I'll distract him while you support Kajira from behind. Sounds like a plan. Kajira shrugged. I was just going to fight him head on. But I'd be damned if I let this punk paralyze me. Stain narrowed his eyes. Three against one? That's not very fair. Kajira scoffed. Fair. Yeah right. Call murder fair. Actually, don't answer that. Stain blinked at him in slight confusion, but as the green lightning of full cowling appeared around Midoriya, Kajira smirked watching the boy become a blur as he bounced around the narrow alley like a pinball. Clenching his fists, Kajira sent a small wave of atomic radiation through his body, and almost instantly the blue wisps began to rise from him. His eyes glowed blue, as well as the inside of his mouth. Let's go lame, Kajira shouted. Shooting towards the hero killer, Kajira blocked the villain's katana using his right forearm. The collision produced several sparks, and the hero killer's eyes widened in surprise moments before Gajira uppercut him and sent him flying back. Surprised, blades don't work on my scales. I've nullified your greatest weapon. As the hero killer landed on his feet, Midoriya rushed him, forcing him to dodge. No, stop, this is my fight. The jetted one tried to protest, but glancing at him Gajira stated, you'd be dead if it was boy. You, and that pro, this isn't your fight. Then turning back to Stain, Kajira flinched as he saw Midoriya become paralyzed again, for the love of me. He muttered in agitation, Todoroki get Midoriya and protect him and the others until they can move again. I'll deal with the hero killer Todoroki nodded, and without a second thought, Kajira charged at the hero killer. I'm nearly impressed. You managed to hit my students, Kajira said as the hero killer dodged another one of his attacks, before blocking his blades with his forearms. Grunting, Kajira pushed the villain away repositioning himself to stand between him and the others. But the fact I'm a murder means you're not. The hero killer asked. Kajira shook his head. Nah, that doesn't mean squad. I mean, I've killed two. Except they were villains and Namu, not heroes. No, I'm angry because you hit my students, people I bother to acknowledge with their actual names. People who have somehow earned my respect. People that I could call a friend. I'm not some selfless hero, and I'm not trying to be. 
I'm just going to beat the shit out of you because you hurt Midoriya and Todoroki. And that's it. The hero killer's eyes widened, and an intrigued stare broke out on his face. You're not even trying to be a hero. You're more like an anti-hero, or a vigilante. Kajira shrugged. Yeah. But I refer to my previous statement. Without another word, he charged at the hero killer, who left behind him. His sword ready to slice Kajira's back since you're not pretending to be a hero, I'll let you live. But I can't have you interfering with my quickly charging his tail with atomic energy, Kajira said. Atomic tail and whacked the hero killer into the wall, cracking the said wall from the impact and leaving the hero killer dazed and wide-eyed. Kajira, Midoriya, Todoroki, jetted one, and the pro hero all blinked at the hero killer for a moment, attempting to process what just happened. I, uh, think we won, the pro hero said in disbelief. Meanwhile, Kajira slumped over in disappointment, damn, too much atomic radiation. He then felt the eyes of the others move to him, atomic radiation. Midoriya yelped. Kajira groaned. Great explanations. Hore. The next morning, Kajira grumbled as he walked through the hospital room's open door. Damn my mouth. Now I have to explain my radiation to Midoriya. And he's gonna rip it apart like a starving titan. Did you sleep Midoriya? Kajira raised an eyebrow as he saw Todoroki, the jetted one and Midoriya all still bandaged and on beds. No, not really. Midoriya responded, I figured. Me neither. Todoroki responded, but so far none of them had noticed his presence. Midoriya looked up at the ceiling, thinking about that fight now, we did something pretty amazing. Todoroki nodded. Yeah, I agree. Although Gajira did most of the work he took down Stain. After everything that happened back there, it kinda feels like a miracle we're even alive. With my leg messed up, I was an easy target. He probably could have killed me if he really wanted to Midoriya said, glancing at his bandaged leg. Todoroki raised his left arm and looked at it. Yeah, even without Gajira, it seems to me he let us both live on purpose. I'm impressed by you though, Ida. Todoroki turned his gaze to the jetted one. He was actually trying to murder you, but you stood tall. The jetted one shook his head, looking down in shame. That's not true. I was. Having enough of being ignored, Gajira prepared to cough to gain their attention. When he heard footsteps behind him, silencing the children, who finally noticed him. But it was the duo behind him that spoke first. Oh, so the injured youngins are awake. The old man said walking forward, Gran Torino, Kajira. Midoriya greeted, and Manuel too, the jetted one said. The old one glared at Midoriya, walking over to him idiot. I could yell at you for hours right now. Midoriya leaned back slight fear and dread mixing into his expression. Yeah, I'm sorry, but before I do, you've got a visitor. Kajira glanced behind him as an unfamiliar scent entered the room marked by a dog person who stood as tall as himself. This is Hasu's chief of police, Kenji Tsurigami. Kajira raised an eyebrow at the name and instantly decided to call the police, Dog Man. The children went to stand up, but Dog Man stopped them. No, please, stay seated, woof. Woof, so you're the UA students who brought down the hero killer, huh? Dog Man asked, observing each of them one at a time. More or less, Todoroki answered. Stain has some serious injuries. Severe burns and several broken bones. Right now he's in the hospital under strict guard. Woof. Here's a lesson you should have already learned. When quirks became the norm, the police force sought to maintain the status quo. They decided we wouldn't use quirks as weapons. Gajira scoffed at that. Quirks are natural aspects of oneself. Would you deny one usage of their arms because they are weapons? That's when heroes came in. They could do what we couldn't if they were licensed of course, woof. It would be impossible for the police to condone the use of deadly quirks. After all, we're here to stop such harm from being done. The only reasons pros can use their powers now is because of the strict code of ethics that the early heroes chose to abide by. That's why it's against the law for uncertified people to use their quirks to cause injury. Whether you were up against the hero killer or not, none of you had the authority to harm the villain. That means the four of you. And your supervisors, Endeavor, Manuel, Mount Lady and Gran Torino, should receive harsh punishments for this gross abuse of your powers. Particularly you Gajira, you battled Radian two days ago, causing severe amounts of damage to public property in the process. Gajira rolled his eyes at Dogman's long speech. Of course, Mount Maid's seduction tactics don't work over here. Man, now wait just a minute. If Ida hadn't stepped in, Native would have been murdered. And if not for Midoriya, both of them would be dead. And if not for Gajira, we all could have been dead and the hero killer free, not even mentioning all those Radian could have killed. No one else even realized that the hero killer was in Hasu. Are you saying we should have just stood by and watched people die? Todoroki growled, stepping angrily towards Dog Man. Calm down, Midoriya said. So it's okay to break the law as long as it goes your way. Dog Man responded. Gajira again scoffed. The law didn't stop the hero killer, nor did it stop Radian. I did, we did, Dog Man. Kajira turned to glare at Dog Man in the eyes. Dog Man? The police muttered. Where were the pros when Radian appeared? Where were the pros when the hero killer tried to kill the jetted one? I'll give you a hint. 
Not fucking there. Kajira growled. Wait a minute kid. You'll want to hear him out till the end. The old man said. Kajira tisked, but decided to hear dog man out. What I've said is the official stance of the police department, nothing more. Gigajira are clear due to several pro heroes vouching for you, including Godzilla and Star and Stripe, so officially, you were given permission by a pro hero to battle Radiant. But for the rest of you, punishment would only be necessary if this went public. If it did, you'd probably be applauded by citizens everywhere. But there's no way you could escape from being reprimanded. On the other hand, we could say Endeavor saved the day. Stains Burns would support the story completely and we could pretend you weren't involved. Woof. Thankfully there were very few witnesses. This could be the last you heard of any punishments. It would mean no one would know about you though. You'd receive no acclaim at all. The choice is yours. Personally, I know where I stand. I don't want to damage any promising young careers. Not for a mistake like this. Kajira's eyebrows raised, while the blue dude cried. Either way, we'll need to take responsibility for being negligent as supervisors. Kajira clapped a smile on his face. So no extra attention and no punishments. Deal. The dog man nodded a faint smile on his face while the jetted one walked up to the blue boy and bowed. I'm sorry. I should have listened. Blue boy nodded. Yeah. You caused us a lot of trouble. Remember that and don't do it again. Jetted one somehow bowed even lower. Sir. Turning around. Gajira saw Midori bow his head and I apologize as well. Gajira narrowed his eyes and whacked Midori in the back of the head with his tail. Oh. What the heck was that for? Midoriya cried to which he responded, Don't bow your head. It shows weakness. Me, too. We'll leave it to you. Todoroki said bowing slightly to Dog Man. I know it's not fair. You won't enjoy any of the fame and praise you probably would have received otherwise. But at least, allow me as the chief of police. Dog Man then bowed to them, to thank you. Todoroki huffed. You know, you could have started with that. Gajira nodded in agreement, would have saved some time. Forty minutes later, Gajira sat in the hospital room with Todoroki and the jetted one waiting for Midoriya to finish his conversation with Yuraka over the phone. He was no fool. He could nearly see the hormones that came off the boy whenever he talked to Yuraka, and he could smell the beginnings of that same feeling coming from Yuraka whenever she talked to Midoriya. Those two are more oblivious than blind bats, or the insignificant worm is of females. Perhaps the pink one can assist in the ending of said obliviousness. Once she realizes it, Oh, hey Ada, Midoriya said as he returned to the room. I just talked to Yuraka. Midoriya. Ida just got his test results back. Todoroki said Midoriya turned his gaze to the jetted one. Who said, my left hand, might have damage that's permanent. Midoriya's eyes widened. What? Permanent. The jetted one nodded. Both my arms were pretty torn up, but the injury to my left arm was especially severe. There was damage to my bracial plexus, which just means I'll have trouble moving my fingers, and my hand might have some numbness. Apparently, there's a chance it could be healed with nerve transplant surgery. When I came across the hero killer, I stopped thinking rationally. The first thing I should have done was call Manuel, but I got lost in my own anger. I hate him so much, but I can't deny he spoke the truth. That's why until I'm able to call myself a real hero, I'll leave my left hand as it is. Kajira nodded, while Todoroki looked at him unsurely. Are you sure? While the jetted one looked at his left arm, Midoriya spoke up, Ida I feel the same way. My hand is a reminder, too. Kajira glanced at Midoriya's scared hand. During the sports festival, despite Gajira's training and full cowling, Midoriya had been forced to use his full power on several occasions, which resulted in the scarring of his right hand. At first, Midoriya saw the scars as a message that he wasn't strong enough, a failure. But Kajira had corrected that thinking. The scar was a reminder that he still had room to grow. It told him that he would do anything to win and that he must keep that devotion and resolve. Let's get stronger, together, Midoriya said. And the jetted one nodded. I feel kind of bad. Todoroki said, making Gajira, Midoriya and the jetted one look at him, about what? Midoriya asked, whenever I'm involved, someone's hand gets all messed up. Is something wrong with me? Gajira blinked in confusion, and after a quick glance at Midoriya and the jetted one saw they shared his confusion. Am I cursed? Todoroki wondered, glaring at his own hand. Shortly after both Midoriya and the jetted one burst out laughing. Todoroki, I didn't know you had a sense of humor. This isn't a joke. I'm like the hand crusher or something. Todoroki's response resulted in Midoriya, and the jetted one laughing even harder. The hand crusher, Midoriya said, It seems they've forgotten about my slip-up, but I'll need to be more careful now. Gajira, 17 days later, as Gajira walked through the halls of UA, he thought back to the confrontation with the nuclear parasite. I haven't been able to enter that form again. Pausing he raised his right arm and looked at his kaijin hand. I doubt it was a one and done as the children call it but I cannot think of any way to reactivate it other than having my nuclear radiation be torn away. While he momentarily considered the idea, he dismissed it, pain is not necessary for victory or this power. 
There must be another way to access it. Resuming his journey, Kajira's mind flickered to Izuku. If I asked, Izuku would likely figure out how I can transform into that form once again. But I am loath to ask for assistance from anyone. Growling Gajira moderately slammed his tail into a nearby wall in frustration, making a crater as a result. I have been around children and humans for far too long to actually consider assistance. They are affecting me. Eventually, however, Kajira was interrupted by a feminine voice. Whoa, hello, who are you? Is that a tail? And are those scales? Wait, you're a kaijin aren't you? Is it your quirk? You're so tall. Kajira flinched in mild surprise as a periwinkle-haired girl appeared in front of him. Her voice bubbly and curious, and infuriatingly fast. What? Kajira replied looking down at the curious one, who was now poking his biceps with wide eyes and an amazed expression. Well, it's like you're made of steel, she said in awe. What? He repeated. But the curious one ignored him before she began to poke his abs. You could sharpen swords on these abs. She continued a faint blush appearing on her face. Now Gajira was deadpanning. A small tick of annoyance quickly forming. She's got the UA uniform, so I can't kill her. Kajira thought in irritation, but the rodent didn't say anything about physical injury he realized remembering all the times he had punted the insignificant worm with his tail because he was annoyed. Surprisingly, insignificant worm was rather durable. So without another word, Kajira raised his tail behind the curious one's head and whacked her, causing her to slam headfirst into his abs, all the while he looked down at her in disdain. Oh the muffled voice of the curious one was heard, and Kajira said, Leave me alone with that the curious one slid down his chest and onto the floor. Turning around Gajira made his way back to class 1A, only sparing the curious one a single glance as he did. But when he saw her face he blinked in mild confusion and disbelief. Why is her face red? And is that steam? Three minutes later, as Gajira stopped outside the door of class 1A, Gajira spotted Aizawa waving to him. What is it? He asked impatiently. However, he was curious as to why Aizawa had a grin that put villains to shame as he walked up to him. I just wanted your help with something, he whispered as he handed Gajira a sheet of paper, written in Latin luckily enough. Frowning, Gajira read over the sheet, and a grin spread across his face as he read further and further. I accept, he stated, Izuku Midoriya, twelve minutes later. Now then, let's begin the last test, Aizawa said. Remember it's possible to fail this final. If you want to go to camp, then don't make any stupid mistakes. Izuku frowned in slight confusion as he looked at all of the teachers. Why are all the teachers here? Gyro said, voicing Izuku's thoughts. Because it was true, Aizawa, Midnight, Cementos, Present Mike, 13, Ectoplasm and Power Loader were all present. I expect many of you have gathered information and believe you have some idea of what you'll be faced with today. Aizawa continued ignoring Gyro's question. We're fighting those big all-metal robots. Denki shouted while Mina raised an arm in excitement. Fireworks. S. Moors. Here we come, camp. The pink-skinned girl shouted. However, both were silenced by Gajira, who walked up behind them and whacked them in the back of the head in quick succession with his tail. At the same moment, Aizawa's scarf began to move. Actually, this year's test suddenly Principal Nezu emerged from Aizawa's scarf with a hand in the air, will be completely different for various reasons. Gyro, Ajiro and Siro all gasped, Principal Nezu, while Momo sweated in distress you're changing things. Nezu nodded, the tests now have a new focus. There will be hero work, of course, but also teamwork and combat between actual people. Then pointing at them Nezu's face became shadowed. So what does that mean for you? You students will be working together in pairs and your opponents will be one of our esteemed UA. Teachers, isn't that fabulous? Izuku's eyes widened in shock, as his fellow classmates gasped with the exception of Gajira. We're fighting the teachers, Uraraka said in fear. Additionally your partners and your opponents have already been chosen. They were determined at my discretion based on various factors, including fighting style, grades, and interpersonal relationships. First, Yegarazu and Todoroki are a team. Against me, Aawa said with a grin. Then we have Midori appeared with Bakugu. Izuku gasped as he turned to look at Bakugu, who was sharing his expression of shock. And their opponent is. Aizawa trailed off as suddenly a figure crashed into the ground before them, and Izuku's eyes widened even further. I am here to fight. All Might declared as he raised a fist. We're up against All Might. Both he and Bakugu shouted in unison. You're going to have to work together, boys, if you want to win, All Might said with a chuckle. And now, let's announce the teams and the teachers they'll be fighting in order. First will be Rikido Sada and Ijiro Kirishima vs. Cementos. Next will be Tsuyu Asui and Fumikage Takoyami vs. Ectoplasm. Followed by Tenya Ida and Mashiro Ajiro vs. Power Loader. Shoto Todoroki and Momoge Yorazu vs. Eraser Head. Achako Yuraka and Yuga Ayama vs. 13. Mina Ashido and Denki Kaminari against myself. Kayoka Jiro and Koji Koda vs. Present Mike. Hanta Siro and Minoru Minda vs. Midnight. 
And finally Izuku Midoriya and Katsuki Bakugu vs All Might. Nezu said happily, however, Izuku frowned in confusion at Nezu's words. Wait, what about Shoji, Kajira and me? Who do we fight? Toru asked. Class 1 all looked at one another in confusion, but Izuku and Momo both caught a small grin on Kajira's face. Oh that's simple, Nezu said and looking back at him Izuku's blood froze as he saw the shadow that covered Nezu's face. Then much to Izuku's horror Gajira walked forward and stood next to the teachers. As fight number 8, Toru Hagakura and Mizo Shoji, you will be facing Gajira. Toru and Shoji screamed in fear as Gajira grinned evilly at them. They're dead all of class 1 a thought in unison. To complete the exam you'll have 30 minutes. In order to win, your objective is to put these handcuffs on your teacher. Nezu proclaimed as he held out a pair of handcuffs. Where you can win if one of you manages to escape from the combat stage, Nezu explained. So we've either got to capture the teacher or run away. It's basically like the combat training. Denki said deep in thought. Yeah right. You aren't the ones fighting fucking Gajira. Toru shouted in such fear that Izuku could literally see the seat of the invisible girl. Yeah, but is it okay to just jet? Nina asked, and Nezu gave her a thumbs up. Yup, it's gonna be much different than that combat training y'all went through earlier. After all, you're up against people way better than you better. Really? Gyro said in disbelief. Wait, aren't you just the announcer? She asked. Hey, watch your mouth girl, have some respect. Present Mike yelled. This time, your exam will be very similar to a real battle. 13 said as strange as it is, please think of us as villains. She continued. Class 1 all looked at Kajira thinking not a problem since Kajira's grin was all teeth as he spoke. In the real world when you meet someone you think you can fight, then fight to your last breath. But, in instances where you're outmatched, it would be smarter to run away and find help. Todoroki, Ida, Midoriya. You and Kajira all understand. I'm sure Gajira scoffed, crossing his arms pridefully please. I've never met an opponent who I've been unable to defeat with ease. Sue tilted her head to the side. What about that radiation villain from a while back? Ribbit. Gajira glared at her, and where is that villain now? Gajira asked ominously. Izuku gulped. After Gajira's battle against Radian, the radioactive villain just vanished. Not a trace was left behind. So why is he saying it like that? Shaking off his thoughts Izuku tensed in anticipation as he looked at All Might. So we fight to win. Or run to win. That's right. All Might said, spreading his arms in congratulations. It's a test of your decision-making skills. But with these rules, you're probably thinking your only real choice is to flee. That's why the support course made these super clever accessories for us. All Might then brought out a strange band. Behold, ultra-compressed weights. Present Mike exclaimed. And in the corner of his eye Izuku saw Kajira raise an eyebrow in interest. These babies will add about half our body weight to our physiques. It's not much, but they will eat up our stamina and make it harder for us to move around. Oh, shoot. These are heavier than I thought All Might grunted as he put on eight bands. They are, Gajira asked, and turning his gaze to Gajira Izuku's jaw dropped. Gajira was sporting sixteen bands, double what All Might was wearing. And even as Izuku watched Gajira put four additional bands on himself, bringing the number to twenty, and as he looked around he huffed in disappointment. All out. Damn, wanted a challenge. He muttered while Toru started hiding behind Tenya help me she pleaded we had a contest to come up with these designs. And young Hatsum ended up winning it All Might said, wow good for Hatsum. Izuku said remembering the pink hat. Hatsum, hmm, I'll have to pay her a visit. I'll need better bands for training, Izuku's too. Kajira muttered, and Izuku practically felt his soul leave his body. You think we need a handicap to win against you? Bakugu asked. Well think again, he said with a straight face. Kajira raised an eyebrow at Bakugu and Toru tackled the blonde. Don't. You'll make him angry. Wait, what happened to Shoji? He wondered, before turning to see Shoji was pale with fear. He's frozen. All Might laughed. This'll be fun. Two hours later, Izuku watched on in anticipation as Kajira walked into the building where Toru and Shoji were already hidden. Kajira smirked as he stood in front of the exit. Begin. Nezu's voice called. A buzzer sounded and Kajira didn't even move an inch, instead just opting to stand where he was and wait. Why is he just standing there? Yuraka asked. Ida shrugged. What do you mean? Yuraka pointed at Kajira who had actually begun to whistle in boredom. I mean, with Toru's invisibility quirk she can just sneak right past him, or she could sneakily capture him. So shouldn't he be hunting them? Yuraka explained. Izuku frowned. True. But Kajira is not one to let himself become the prey. Momo nodded in agreement, but even she couldn't explain Kajira's actions. However, their question was answered soon enough, but was immediately replaced by another. Without warning, Kajira flicked his tail and the surprised shout of Toru followed. Izuku's eyes widened as he saw a small burst of dust emerge from a nearby pillar, and his eyes widened even further when he realized what just happened. Did he just hit Toru? Yuraka said in complete shock. Kajira began to laugh. You think your quirk will work on me invisible one? 
Izuku's jaw dropped in disbelief and based on the gasps behind him, the jaws of the others all dropped as well. How did he see her? She's meant to be invisible Ida said in shock. And recovery girl chuckled. Oh she is invisible. But let me ask something. What does invisibility do? Momo frowned. It makes someone undetectable to the naked eye. Recovery girl nodded. So that gets rid of one natural sense. How many does Gajira have? Izuku's eyes widened. He can smell her. He muttered and Yuraka shivered. Hold up what? He smells her. She said in slight disgust. Recovery girl chuckled. Gajira's mutation quirk enhances his senses to the point where it's a quirk in itself. Enhanced vision, sensitive touch, taste, hearing and smell. Momo nodded in understanding. Gajira is detecting her with his other senses. Hearing and smell. Yoraka returned her vision to where Gajira was pointing to where they presumed Tori was. I can smell everything in this room. And I can hear everything within as well. Every breath you take, every step you make I can hear like the clearest of waves. Your quirk is worthless against me, Gajira said. It certainly helps that Gajira can change his vision type, Recovery Girl added. And Izuku looked at her like she was crazy. Huh? Recovery Girl chuckled. Oh, he didn't know. Ever since his battle against Radiant, Gajira's been able to change his type of vision between seven types. Airwaves, radiation, night vision, infrared, minor electroreception and his normal vision Momo raised an eyebrow, you only listed six. What's the seventh? Recovery girl pointed at Gajira, a new type of vision, which he's taken to calling absolute. Light reflection and refraction won't work on him when he uses it. Izuku's mouth went dry when he realized what that meant. So he can use absolute vision to see through Hagakir's quirk. Ida asked, and recovery girl nodded. Yep. Just don't tell anyone about it. I'll never hear the end of it if word gets out. The four students all nodded in unison, mentally vowing that Minda would never discover that power. Kajira. Kajira watched on in complete boredom as he gazed upon the infrared form of the invisible one. Multi-armed one. Where are you? He called looking around. He wasn't nearby. His smell was too distant for that. Additionally, his heartbeat was getting further away. He growled as he frowned. Are you such a coward that you run? He shouted in disdain. Snarling he walked forward and grabbed the invisible girl by the neck using his tail. However, his grip was loose enough that he didn't choke the young girl but tight enough that she couldn't escape. Scoffing Gajira turned around and stormed back to the entrance, where he turned and waited, dropping the invisible girl to the ground while keeping her in his grasp. How did you catch me? The invisible girl asked. Groaning Gajira looked at her blankly. I told you girl. My senses are far superior to that of a mortal's. Finding you was no challenge he decided that it would be in his best interest not to reveal his numerous vision types right now. Likely it would cause the invisible girl discomfort and she would start calling him a pervert, which would lead to possible distraction and certainly annoyance from the insignificant worm later on. Plus he just didn't want to explain it. However, Gajira was brought from his musings when suddenly the roof above him cracked and several tons of debris fell on top of him. Acting quickly he tossed the invisible girl aside where her frail body would be safe from the debris. Did I get him? As he lay on the ground beneath the rubble, Kajira's eyes narrowed as he heard the voice of the multi-armed one above him. Foolish he muttered as he stood up, easily pushing away the debris in a similar fashion to how one would remove their blankets in the morning. Whoa! The multi-armed one shouted in surprise as he leapt away from the rising Kajira. Once he stood to his full height, Kajira brushed a piece of dust from his left shoulder with a bored expression. I expected more from you boy, he said as he returned to his normal vision. The multi-armed one's eyes widened in disbelief as he stared at Gajira. No way. That was several tons of debris, he said, and Gajira scoffed. Only several tons. No wonder why it didn't work. Far to light. The souls of both the multi-armed one and invisible girl decided to vacate their bodies at his words, and in unison, both fell backwards unconscious. Seeing this, Gajira growled and walked over to pick the duo up. Weak and pathetic. He muttered as he stormed out with both children hoisted over his shoulder. Disgraceful. The weak-willed are crushed by the strong. He thought as his mind flashed to the past. The next day, Kajira looked down at the depressed forms of the pink, lips, blonde number one, red-haired one, invisible girl, and multi-armed ones with slight disdain. E everyone, I look forward to hearing all your stories of campus the pink one sobbed. Maybe they'll end up letting you go. There might be a list-minute twist or something, Midoriya said attempting to reassure them. Kajira scoffed. They failed Midoriya. Each of them made mistakes during combat, and now they must pay for them. Blonde number one pointed at him, really? What mistakes huh? He asked, and Gajira rolled his eyes with a sigh, pointing at each of the duos as he spoke. First, pink and blonde number one. You were unable to examine the surrounding area and descended into panic once the rat began his assault. Second, red-haired and lips. Your approach was boneheaded, stupid, and predictable, each of which resulted in your defeat. And finally, invisible girl and multi-armed one. Your mistake was thinking you could fight me in the first place. He didn't miss the sweat drops of all the children as he spoke, but none of them spoke up. 
and none got the chance as the door was slammed open revealing Aizawa's form. Once the bell rings you should be in your seats, he said. Kajira nodded. Before looking around and seeing every other student in the class had been seated and were silent and still, prompting him to blink, grunting to himself, Kajira walked over to his seat, sat down and turned his gaze to Aizawa as he walked to his desk. Morning. Unfortunately, there are a few of you who did not pass your final exams. So when it comes to the training camp in the woods, suddenly, a grin grew across Aizawa's face as he said in a tone that almost resembled excitement, everyone is going. He can smile. He has energy. We really get to go to camp. The red-haired one exclaimed, seriously? The pink one asked, yeah. The good news is that only one of you bombed the written exam. Aizawa paused for a moment, glancing at Kajira, who snarled in response. Seven failed the practical, badly. Three teams of course, and then Siro failed as well. Aizawa wisely continued. Albos exclaimed in annoyance. Crap I knew it. Minta made it to the gate but I didn't do nearly enough to pass. How are we meant to beat Kajira? We dropped a building on him and it didn't even scratch him. The invisible girl shouted. Let me explain, Aizawa said. For the practical battles, the teachers made sure to leave a way for the students to win. Otherwise, you never would have stood a chance. We were interested in observing how you each worked together and approached the task at hand, Aizawa said. But didn't you say that the teachers wouldn't be holding back? The tailed one asked, while the invisible girl added, and when did Gajira leave an opening for us? That was just to get you on edge. You should have realized that when Gajira didn't use his beam, and as for him leaving an opening, he left a gap for you to escape as he tracked Ajiro, as well as when you dropped several tons on him, albeit it didn't last long. Besides the camp will focus more on building your strength. Those who failed need those lessons the most. We were never going to separate you. That was just a logical deception that we used he finished. While the failures all celebrated, the jetted one shot up with a raised hand. Mr. Aizawa this is the second time you've lied to us aren't you afraid we'll lose faith in you? He shouted. A little blunt there Tenya, Yuraka said. Kajira just shrugged. He didn't really care either way, although he wasn't happy that he'd been lied to about the invisible and multi-armed ones making it to the camp if they failed. That's a good point. I'll consider it. But I wasn't lying to you about everything. Failure is failure Aizawa glared at the failures. We've prepared extra lessons for the seven of you. Frankly, they'll be far tougher than what you'd face at summer school Gajira barked a laugh at the broken looks on their faces. Don't look so disappointed. This is what you need, and you hoped for this. He pointed his tail at the red-haired one. And you, I expected you to be excited at the challenge. Disappointing. The failures all glared at him out of the corners of their eyes, likely all having bitter thoughts along the lines of, Shut up. 30 minutes later. Hey, Gajira. The invisible girl greeted as she slid in front of him, causing him to raise an eyebrow. What is it, girl? He asked. You wanna come shopping with us? She asked. No, 